So we'll talk about the hitchhiker and um, a little bit about the, the manual and stuff like that that's been written on the hitchhiker. I do believe that the hitchhiker is a unique device in that it it functions so well and it adds a lot of versatility to our climbing systems without a lot of restrictions. When you look, when you look over um, the manual, you won't see a lot of don't do this, don't do that. It it's hitch based, mm -hmm. yeah. and so because it's hitch based, a lot of those warnings that you'll get with a full mechanical device mm -hmm. just aren't there. I mean, right. it's just it doesn't exist. Not that there's not things to be concerned about when you're using a hitch based system, but they're not there. So um, I'll just kind of read this over, and you can follow along with me if you want in the beginning, but. Uh, it's a unique device in the world of multi-centers, a device that allows movement up, down, laterally, with little or no configuration change. This is something that's unique to tree climbing, and we touched on just a little bit when you talk about sprat and you talk about rock climbers, or even cavers. Um, none of those disciplines um, have the, the need that we do. Right. That requires us to go up, get on a limb, maybe unweight our device a little bit, and then go lateral. move laterally, yeah. and then maybe go back down, and then go back up again. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're talking about industrial access, they're generally on a rope, and they're going one direction. Mm -hmm. um, rock climbers don't really have that, and we'll, we'll touch on more of that too. But um, with the hitchhiker, it pretty much does all of those things. It can go from a single rope to a doubled moving rope with, I mean, you have to connect the other end of your climbing line to make it a doubled moving rope, but that's all, you, that's all you're doing. That's literally and, it. And it's literally it. And there's, there's not a lot of other things that you have to do to it. You don't have to worry about um, some of the functioning parts becoming disabled right. because it gets touched or whatever by the other side of the line so um, so and it's the hitchhiker XF is also the only device that combines a load bearing anchor point with the required single rope tending point and allows for on the fly added friction and that's the little friction plug and yeah. we'll get into that a little mm -hmm. bit but most of today is just focusing on on using it in a couple of different configurations it's midline attachable does not alter the path of the rope. It can be attached to a weighted line. In other words, if, if, if somebody's on that line and for whatever reason you wanted to get on that line, you mm -hmm. can do that. It doesn't, you don't have to bend the rope. You don't have to do anything. You can <clears throat> put it on a tensioned, yep. a tensioned climbing this line. Would, this would be like for our it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, cool. it, it just kind of does, it just does everything. It really does. Well, that was one of the majors because I was on the Unicenter for a couple of years and you can't do that on a Unicenter. Yeah, a lot of devices you, know? you can't. And I, I love, again, I, um, I like a lot of these other devices for mm -hmm. special purposes, but. Yeah. Um, so let, me, let me ask you this. So when you say uh, you can put on a weighted line, so um, it will be useful for rescue? Like if, it was, if, um, if somebody's down on that line and you wanted to get on that rope and go down to them uh -huh. and that was the best uh -huh. a option could you go up? you could do that yeah you could yeah. well you, you, this wouldn't be weighted if you're going up to them could you go up to them on this tailing rope yep yeah you know, and that's within range to where you could switch over the lanyard and stuff sure. like that and as and, and at that point it's not a weighted line but okay. an, another place that you'll see a weighted line is if it's on a um, high angle i'm not talking about vertical mm -hmm. but on a speed line type of a thing mm -hmm. you can go down you can go up that if you want um, wow. if you want to fight yeah <laughs> and, and you can you can walk up a angled line yeah. um, you can put it on that angled line you don't have to take the tension off yeah. you can put it on a high line if you want yeah. you know if you wanted to do a traverse uh, and work your way across the line or something mm -hmm. um, then you can you can work your put it on that high line without having to take some tension out of the high line yeah. and Put it on the high line and then work your way over. And then if the high line gets lowered or whatever, you can go down it. You know, we've done those little speed line um, yeah. tricks. Yeah, at the club. Um, so um, it does not requ require a configuration change or added components, 
when switching from doubled moving rope or single rope, again, I said, you do have to attach the, the better end, end. Yeah. Better the, other, other, to your the other end uh, of the line. That's the only thing you have to do to make a doubled moving rope. Right. But um, in other words, it can go from 100% friction to nearly 0% friction for ascent without changing the configuration. A lot of devices, if you want to go from 0 to 100%, you've got to add something to it. And in the manual, we have talked a lot about uh, proportional friction and controllable friction. I think those things, um, a device works very well when they are um, distinguishable. Mm -hmm. You can tell the difference. If, if uh, a full mechanical device tries to um, incorporate both of those into the one device, or it's not real clear about how it's uh, separated, then it, the performance, I think, suffers. So um, it works equally well on a high angle zip line as it does on a vertical line. It does not have a big top exposure or collapsible components. It is built with strong solid parts and low profile simple design. Because it is a hybrid device using 360 degree wraps with a friction hitch, any rope flattening has little effect, making for constant and predictable performance. The replacement hitch cord does not require a spliced or sewn termination, making uh, replacement inexpensive. Um, Sorry, what is, um Big top exposure. Big top exposure is. T I'll talk about the unisender because I do sell the unisender, and yeah. I put a drum on it to add some function and add uh, some friction to it and stuff like that, or just make it smoother. Um, when you look at a lot of mechanical devices, they'll have a lever up there. There'll be there'll be something on that fully mechanical device in order to allow the bend that's been put in the rope to be released or whatever it's using to uh, adjust that friction uh, it usually takes some kind of a lever or something like that mm -hmm. that lever adds exposure and if it's weighted if it's heavily weighted then there's less exposure because it takes a lot of force to get it released i mean we've played we with tried, that stuff yeah, like that yeah. if it's lightly loaded then it's very easy mm -hmm. to uh, have that release if it's lightly loaded, uh, you're standing on a you're standing out on a limb someplace. Your device is still. We'll talk about this too more. But if say you you still have some tautness, there's some tension in your rope, but not a lot because you're standing on a limb, right? Um, in, in those particular cases, that whatever lever or whatever mechanical device is used to release the friction, all of a sudden that gets really easy to release. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and it can slip on you. Yeah, it and, will slip on you. And if you're standing on a limb, and that mechanical device, and this could also apply to a hitch cord, but to what I'm saying is to a much less extent. Mm -hmm. um, if you're standing and it's unweighted, and all of a sudden what you're standing on disappears, then if you have an article of clothing, your sleeve, the cuff of your glove any of those things can snag on that high exposed area and release it. Mm -hmm. And that mechanical device doesn't know that you're not intending to do that. Right. It'll, yeah. it'll just, okay, we want to go fast, you know, it's released and, yeah. and down you go until somebody realizes that they need to release that yep. or they can't come to the end. With a damaged rope? Because I've been there. Yeah. My lanyard, quite frankly, needs to be replaced at this point because it's you know it gets a little frays in it. But it's the hitch that locks on it. Okay. Yeah, I would the, say the hitchhiker so. passes it. <laughs> your your question is if you're if you're sliding down or if you're on a on a rope that has a defect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that can actually be sap on the rope and stuff too. Sometimes yeah, sure. you get sap, and yeah. and I've told people too. White and pines. A lot of times, if you get if you get sap from a white pine or. Um, the hemlock and stuff they got a lot of sap in them and stuff like that too mm -hmm. the, the best way i know is just to put that rope on the shelf for about three months and let that <laughs> stuff just dry out oh, you know we all have another rope right yeah, yeah. and when you come back to it it'll be all dried out and it'll just flake off and it's no big deal yeah. um but f for that you normally what good. happens is it'll jam up on that and okay. the hitch the hitch jams the hitch will yeah. jam up on it no okay. the, the hitchhiker the mechanical part takes a lot of that off of the hitch yeah. so it may not jam as much as some other devices would jam okay. 
but it's going to catch on it's going to catch on the defect and this speaks to a lot of mechanicals that will flatten the device any any of our mechanical things usually squeeze a rope in a horizontal manner they mm -hmm. don't they don't go all the way around it you know whether it's a bend or however it does it it'll be a couple bollards that come together and the hitchhiker at uh, the slick pin those come together and the dog bone it comes together even though the channel on the hitchhiker is curved on one side there's a flat side to that so if you're going up and down that same section of rope a lot of times they'll start to flatten some mechanical devices are just really scary when you hit that because what was holding a moment ago when it hits that flat spot let go your your rope is no longer a 11.7 millimeter rope mm -hmm. at that flat spot it becomes 10 and all of a sudden your adjustments and everything are not set for that and off you go the advantage again this speaks to uh, a, a hitch based system is that your hitch is wrapping around that whole bunch of times in 360 degree yeah. bends and so if you do get rope flattening because I think that's unavoidable if you're going up and down the same spot the impact from that is much less minimal okay. because your hitch is circulating around that whole rope and, right. and so it's so I have a recent effect. experience with this actually <laughs> down in South Florida my friend had me go up his mast down there because we had a, a pulley up there that needed to be repaired yeah. and he wasn't strong enough to winch me up his main halyard yeah. so I went up on my hitchhiker on my XF and his old halyard was salted and somewhat uh, aged out so the bluing on the rope was coming and all that yeah. stuff on the way down the hitch locked repeatedly because of the the salt come and up. the bluing coming come off up. of it on the hitch yeah so i'm on my foot and knee ascender i hook back in stand up on it to release the hitch oh sure. uh, work and then it past the... to work it to <clears throat> free that up and then it would go down three or four more feet and lock again and yeah, okay. build up you know and all, all the way down 65 foot every three or four feet i'd have to stop stand on it free it up and then and quite frankly that rope i probably shouldn't i mean it, it was strong obviously yeah, it was still it strong like but was. all of that <clears throat> salt air down there and all of the age of the ro a couple of years of life on that how you're running up and down and living out in the salt and never being protected from the sunlight and all that stuff yeah. decayed it to the point where i literally had to scrub the hitchhiker and everything else to get all the bluing and everything else off of it yeah. from the rope wow. <clears throat> yeah so you know and if, if it was a full mechanical device you'd probably be much more extreme than that when it comes to the impact. I'd have been locked. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's kind of like too, um, a hitch, if you just, it'd be, it'd be great if you could just climb on a hitch without yeah. having to have something that provides the proportional friction, mm -hmm. but you know, th then they just don't work. I've, right. I've been to so many comps where you'll see somebody doing a aerial rescue and you know, they don't do it properly and the hitch bears the entire load all of a sudden and it's locked on and the guys Stuck. i've seen people just pounding on that thing they yep. can't get the release they can't get the hitch to release yeah um yeah if i hadn't had my knee and foot ascender <coughs> with me to be able to, to get off of the hitch itself i'd have been stuck right there either i do it on the foot lock or I'm something done. Yeah, yeah i'd have to go to foot yeah. locking or some way to get myself off of it to release that hitch yeah. so there's a there's a bunch of other stuff in the manual and i think as we um work with the with the hitchhiker will probably cover some of those things um so we'll kind of leave that where that is um let me talk about we'll, we'll start going through the syllabus the, and try to cover um what we want to do and eventually we'll get out in the sun where it's a little bit warmer and standing here in the shade too sure. um so i probably won't go over the warnings and the cautions but as you're doing training and things i mean that's always a that's always a big deal sure but you won't see in if when you look through the hitchhiker manual you won't see a lot of the typical warnings and cautions in there um, other than the fact that in, it's a hitch mm -hmm. and if you were teaching somebody how to climb on a blake's hitch there'd be a lot of the same warnings but you wouldn't have a warning about collapsing a mechanical part 
of the Blake's hitch. And right. It's just, yeah. you know, okay, this is how a hitch works and make sure it's tied properly and, you know, you've tested it and all that kind of stuff. I have so, a question. Yeah. Um, so let's say you're, you're climbing SRT <coughs> and this <coughs> happened to you. Uh huh. Remember when the, um, when the system failed and you came down and you're using friction, your bare hands to uh, provide friction? Right. So my question to you, and, and this is a question to um, all SRT devices, and they haven't even brought this up. Um, once you're up five feet, um, why wouldn't you want to tie a safety knot, a lock safety knot with a uh, uh, round nose carabiner sitting inside that safety knot when you're five feet off the ground? Just as protection. Yeah, we've talked we've talked about yeah. that before, and and I'll just I mean, TJ can add to that, but the reason is um, if you were to take a free fall onto that knot that's just five feet off the ground, that's probably going to be pretty severe. Okay. Uh, it may not be as severe as hitting the ground, but it's also again <clears throat> we use uh, that rope to access the tree, and once we're up in the tree we're moving all around and so all of a sudden it's not that knot that you put yeah. five feet above the ground it's not at five feet on the ground anymore it's 20 feet off the ground and then when you try to pull your rope around to someplace mm -hmm. that carabiner is going to get snagged on yeah. and then it's like well why don't because when you're teaching somebody initially on a blake's hitch and maybe they're young maybe they're a new climber or whatever as an instructor you're always going to be holding the tail until you're confident that they know how to use that Blake sitch, right? Mm -hmm. And you have control over them. If they, for whatever reason, they panicked or they pulled it and released the whole thing, you got a hold of the tail, they can't come down. Well, as soon as you start teaching somebody SRT, you can't have control over them anymore. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's like, well, why not just put a safety knot every time they go up five feet, mm -hmm. put a little safety knot like you do once you started to release them, I mean, that's kind of the natural flow yeah. I would take is I hold the tail. Once they're good with it, you teach them how to tie a little safety knot. They go up there and half of those fall out anyway. Uh -huh. But, you know, you, you teach them how to do that and, and everything else. Well, if you've ever tried to rope walk going up the rope and then reach down to get the tail to two, I mean, it's, it just becomes very impractical okay. because we're rope walking. And... The other thing, and I think I think this is in the syllabus, we'll talk about this too, but the knee ascender and the foot ascender is that backup. Yes. That's Those true. aren't life support, right. but they are a backup. If if for whatever reason I'm rope walking and I go to sit down and my hitch doesn't engage or I've done something that's oh, not yeah. gonna let my hitch engage, where is that gonna go? Yeah. I'm going to go down to my oh, knee ascender. I'm going to make a ball. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to end up like this. You'll make a ball yeah. if 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 you only have if you're one footing it. And I have a video of a guy one footing it. Uh -huh. He's going up, and um, his foot ascender comes off. It was one of those that doesn't have a lock on it. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a cam and stuff. So anyway, he's one legging it up with a foot ascender, and then he goes through some foliage, and his foot ascender comes off. And so he thinks, I'm just going to lean back into my multi-sender. I won't say what, what it was, but he's going to lean back into his multi-sender and put his foot ascender back on, right? Uh -huh. He goes to lean back into his multi-sender. That's not engaged either because going through all it's that foliage, the foliage, oh, the foliage oh, so is the holding that. Is the spring, oh. the spring oh. is disengaged because it's got... He slid down the rope and you see him slam into a light post on the way down. I guess he didn't hurt himself. But he took one of those rope burning or glove burning slides yeah. all the way to the ground. Yeah. And luckily he wasn't that high that yeah. it turned into something really serious. Yeah. But, but the knee ascender and the foot ascender provide a backup for exactly what you're talking right. about. And with the knee ascender won't allow you to go into the full pretzel. Mm -hmm. You know, if you mm -hmm. only have a foot ascender, yeah. then that That's foot ascender. Grace. Yeah, I, at, at my age, Putting my foot ascender at the bottom of my multi sender where my where my rope bridge is, that really hurts. Yeah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but with a knee ascender, then if I do slide down on it, I only go to the top of the knee ascender. Yeah. And that's no big deal. I can pull mm -hmm. myself back up from that. Exactly. And 
there's some things to practice and stuff. But does that kind of answer that yeah, question? Yeah, sort of answers. Yeah, it sort it's, of answers. It's a different animal, yeah. uh, and there's ways to try to deal with that mm -hmm. uh, and still make it make it safe. And okay. and I think, of course, I sell the ascenders and foot ascenders, mm -hmm. and so it could sound like I'm advocating a foot ascender and a knee ascender. But the reason I sell those is because I like them, I use them, and I think I think they have a, a huge oh, sure. safety safety aspect not only not only the efficiency but also a huge well, safety yeah, aspect. The point. yeah so um so some of the foundational concepts of what my approach to a lot of this is one is that the ends of our climbing line are the most versatile yet are most of the time left laying on the ground mm -hmm. you'll see most of the time uh somebody will set a midline alpine butterfly they'll send that up there and I see this in the comps all the time. Or if it's a base anchor, where's the end, you know, one's base anchored to the, to the tree mm -hmm. and the other one's laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. if, it's, right. if it's a cinch canopy tie or crown tie, yeah. they'll cinch that and it goes up. Again, both ends are laying on the ground. Uh -huh. I believe that the most versatile and functional part of our climbing line, with the exception of the, whatever part we're actually attached to and keeps us from falling out of the tree, is the ends of our climbing line. That's where it's easiest to tie termination knots and tie anchors and stuff. Mm -hmm. So everything I do is kind of designed around having access to the versal part of the climbing line. I mean, to me, it's just, it's, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think a lot of that goes back to the time of a double moving rope. Although even with a double moving rope, you have one end in, in yeah. your possession, right? Yes, exactly. But which gives you somehow, <clears throat> somehow in the switch to SRT, we've kind of forgotten that that part of the climbing line is really the most versatile. Um, I think that we've talked about this, but the hitchhiker, it's just, it's really simple. You know, it's a hitch based system. It doesn't have a lot of components mm -hmm. that can fail. It's, it's, you know, there's, there's not high tolerance in uh in the parts that have to match up mm -hmm. um the slick pin is has some tolerance to it mm -hmm. that that is met uh and we'll talk about that but it takes like nine actions to get that slick pin to disconnect yeah. um there's just not a lot of things that can fail so if you take a swing and bump it into sliding sideways or over a limb unintentionally and stuff like that you're not going to bend the crap out of it it's, it's not going to get hurt right um so, um, tree climbing is a different discipline than rock climbing or industrial access. I mentioned this a little bit. Um, in, in rock climbing, typically, and I'm not a rock climber, so somebody could criticize me, me either. Uh, on, on my understanding of how it works. I mean, I've, I've done the gym and I have done a couple little rock climbing and stuff. So you're um, on a belay, first yeah. of all. Well, I'm on a, I'm on a harness. Yep. that's attached with a figure eight right mm -hmm. that they use a figure eight yep um and there's it's a set knot right there on on their on their harness yep. then it goes up to wh whatever anchors up there and stuff like that and it comes back down and the guy's on belay yep. the guy on belay what does he have to do pay attention he just has the belay that's yeah. all he, he yeah. he's paying attention exactly right he's paying attention to that belay device he's making sure that it's properly configured mm -hmm. and that it also has some tension mm -hmm. yep. that there's some tautness in that whole thing to keep it all configured and a lot of people will say well that's that's to keep the shock load down but a lot of the rock climbing our uh, ropes are intended to um, compensate and stretch yeah. mm -hmm. and deal with the shock load mm -hmm. so they're still making sure that that's totally configured. It's not just for the shock load. It's to make sure that that belay device is properly configured and that it will engage properly. When that guy comes off of the ledge, it's going to engage. Right. And unexpectedly, you don't have time. When he slips, you don't have time to go, oh, I got to get this thing configured and put it in the right place. So uh, when, when we're tree climbing, and I'll see this with guys with, heavy experience with rock climbing, they'll move around that tree 
like they got somebody down there on belay. Oh, yeah. Now wow. you're talking. Now you're wow. talking. There's, there That's isn't exactly that right. guy on belay. That's right. And so no. they're, they just, and it's, it's something for them to overcome. Mm -hmm. I have 40 years of flying airplanes in the first person view, right? Mm -hmm. When I started learning how to fly RC airplanes, and that thing turned around and started coming towards me, that, <laughs> was, that was really hard to learn. Wow. Because everything's, <coughs> everything's backwards at that moment. And I think that it was harder for me to learn that than it would have been some, for somebody that doesn't actually have real airplane experience. Because my mind is just like, I'm no, when I first you know, person looking yeah, forward. first person, it's always that way. So I have to overcome that and then relearn something. Rock climbers have the same thing. They have to learn that. And I've seen that in falls in competition, and I see people climb like that, and I see it more often than people that have rock climbing experience. They'll just start moving around the tree, and somebody will say, well, take the slack out of your rope. That's part of it, but that's not all of it. And I think we'll talk about more of that in, in the syllabus and stuff like that. But keeping that configured, keeping some tautness, is very hard to do when you're limb walking and when you're moving about the tree. Mm -hmm. And part of the advantage of the Hitchhiker XF and the way that the anchor point is the same as the tending point and everything else is that it does tend to self-configure and it has a lot less exposure on the hitch. So you still have to pay attention mm -hmm. to keeping things configured but it's much less than you might have to pay attention with um, a mechanical device. Mm -hmm. it, goes, it goes even with the connection, and I'll talk about this more too, even with the connection of the carabiner. Um, carabiners are great, the auto lock and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk more about that. Um, but again, you have to pay attention to those things, otherwise they get sideways, they get misconfigured, they get side loaded. And as we know, a carabiner, it doesn't work very well if it gets side loaded. It doesn't have the strength, plus right. the gate is very vulnerable to that kind of stuff. So, so tree climbing is very different. And the Sprat guys, Sprat is mostly hanging on the rope. Sure, they use a twin system, but they'll use uh, rated anchors and everything else, and their whole system is rated. And we go up a tree that has no rating to it at all, right. and we get up and First thing we do is we stand on a limb and get the weight off of our harness and we stand and walk around and we do stuff. Sprat guys, they're not, they're usually hanging for, again, I'm not an industrial access guy. Right. I don't spend time doing that. But most of those guys are always hanging from a rope. Mm -hmm. And yeah. every time you see any of that, they're hanging from a rope. They're just hanging from a rope. So it's easy for them to keep everything tensioned. Mm -hmm. And for that secondary, they'll use an ASAP with a shock loading attachment to it. And that thing's designed to just go up and down the rope and then engage when it needs to. So um, again, that's, that's hanging from a rope and they have a device that's specially designed so that if something over here fails, it engages and it doesn't, you know, you try to climb around a tree and I've seen guys try to, try to um, incorporate that and it usually doesn't go real well. So. That's kind of why the sprat and the tree climbing, uh, or the uh, rock climbing, is a little bit different. And I think it does best when people can leave that stuff at the door when what you go to what does learn that. Um, I don't know. We'd have to Google it. I forgot. It's, All right, I'll look at it. It's, uh, that's that's industrial. Yeah, that's yeah, it's industrial, industrial okay, access. Got it. And, industrial access. Okay, um, that's yeah. fine. Okay. Sprat and yeah, yeah. there's the the international. Yeah, I, you have to. Our route is the Industrial Rope Access Trade Association. Sprata is the Society of Professional Rope Access. Yeah, Society of Professional Rope Access, and then there's a T on there, I guess, technique or training or something. Tech technicians. Technicians, okay. Perfect. Now we know. <laughs> Isn't Google great? Technology. <laughs> yeah. Um, Climbing systems to match the environment. Again, we're climbing in a tree, and so the Hitchhiker XF, I think, is really designed to match how we're going to work in a tree. Um, and we'll see that as we get involved with it. Um, 
I mentioned this before, but trees lack a rated anchor point and are not injured, engineered for our use. In fact, the trees are reciprocal of what we need. The tree has most of the strength at the base uh -huh. to hold itself up, right? Uh -huh. What do we do? <clears throat> we put our ropes as high as we freaking can <laughs> up in that tree where it's the weakest uh -huh. and we put all of our weight on there. We just, we do it all completely backwards of how the tree is designed. And so yeah. I think if you, if you go into tree climbing with that understanding mm -hmm. and, and engineer around that, um, that kind of helps. That goes to how I'll initially set a rope. I'll try to set close to the stem and not as high as I used to, you know, and in competitions, <laughs> you'll see guys, they'll set it really high. Yeah. Um, at some point I'm going to talk about this too, but a competition is a different environment. You've got a rope tech up there, you've got people that have set that course, and you've got people that are telling the competitor, and I've always kind of argued about against this, but they'll tell the competitor, no, you can't put your rope there, you can't put your rope there, you can base anchor here, but you can only canopy anchor over there. They've been up in that tree. Yeah, they've they been, inspected it. They've inspected <laughs> it, they've played in it and everything else, and now Probably they're... Probably Yeah, so a guy will throw it really high, and it's a great anchor and everything, but it's because they all know it. Right. Now you walk away from that competition, and you think, oh yeah, I set it really high, that's what I did. I get the best pendulum swings, and I can work the tree and everything. And then you get up to that anchor, and you look at the top part of that anchor, or something you couldn't see from the ground because of the foliage, and you go, oh. We wrap. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it seems so, to me that like a, the point of a tree climbing competition, a big component of that would be making the decision of where to put your rope. So it, I, I would I would agree, um, but competitions have time constraints and they have a lot of a lot of things. And I think if people understand what and the liability involved requires yeah. them to pre inspect and da da da. Oh man, yeah, it's a different animal. <clears throat> Um, so the hitchhiker is a, a simple device. It doesn't have it doesn't have a lot of linkages um, that can uh, get broken. Um, I've done pull tests on this the best way I could. I put uh, eight thousand pound B line to the uh, dog bone there and gave it a straight end pull. Um, it would break at about 5,000 pounds, the B line. It would break the hitch cord every time. Mm -hmm. And none of this, the, the swing arm here, uh, the dog bone, the slick pin, nothing moved. It didn't come out of tolerances. It didn't, there was no plastic or elastic deformation in any of the metal parts. So I may at some point take like a, I don't know, I'd probably take a, a 3 8 or a 10 millimeter U-bolt and put it on with a U-bolt and see if I can get something to break. Wow. But it kind of it kind of uh, gets pointless yeah. at that at that time. So the hitch cord's so, gonna be your failure mode yeah, every time. And, and it's always it will always fail. And the only way it will fail is if somehow it's stuck on the other rope mm -hmm. and yet that's probably, the, then the rope could fail too. Mm -hmm. And it, whatever you're attached to, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't know that where I'm attached in that tree would take a 5,000 pound pull. Right. Um, <coughs> a vehicle, a 5,000 pound vehicle is what you'd have to consider hanging up there. And I don't know that, I mean, most of the time, the structure I'm in and the tree is not gonna hold 5,000 pounds anyway. Right. But the reason we have those extra 5,000 pounds is it's called extra. Mm -hmm. You tie a knot, and now you're down to half. Mm -hmm. And whatever else you're doing, or your rope's a little worn and stuff like that, you're still much more than you'll than you'll ever need. Um, so it's it's just a very simple device, um, and it, it works. So, uh, and I get this question: um, Is it rated? Because we like to climb on rated equipment, even though our tree isn't rated, mm -hmm. we still like to climb on rated ropes and rated carabiners and everything. Everything in ANSI and and all of those things require ratings for our equipment. My, our equipment might be rated different than what a fireman might use and stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. But the answer to that is this is the rating right here, the mm -hmm. hitch cord. 
This is a connection to the hitch cord. Mm -hmm. So this, the mechanical, the metal parts, will hold much more than what the hitch cord will. Mm -hmm. So to answer that question about whether it's rated or not, so, well, the hitch cord is rated. It should be rated, and that's what that's what you're climbing on is a rated hitch cord. Mm -hmm. um, if if the hitchhiker didn't even exist, if all you did is tied a pressic up there and attached it to the rope, what's your rating? It's whatever you got on your hitch cord and your rope. Right. And so, so the answer the answer to that question is it's like really it's not a it's not a valid question. Um, you have to focus on what the hitch cords actually rated that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop just a minute. We're going to go ahead and sort of stop and just push. I could, I could do a lot better by having it. When I, when I do an open ascent competition and stuff like that, and I shed my harness of all the good stuff that helps me climb, <laughs> it's like, oh man, this is, this is easy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling light. I, I was up. surprised when I moved all my working stuff that I wanted to bring with me today yeah. over onto that last night. It's like, oh my God, that went from a very light <laughs> to a very heavy harness. <laughs> all right, let me see what's on the uh, what's on the list. Here. Come, come over here. We're talking about something else. We're up on to the rope. Lacked installation errors upside down. Yeah. So let me talk about installation errors because. Um, <laughs> You ready, guys? <clears throat> it it does it does lack it does lack a lot of installation errors, and I'm just going to run through some possible errors that somebody might make. When you look at this, I've I've written on here left and right. So if you're facing it, you should see this would be on your left side, and this will be on your right side. And the up. That's yeah, and up. That's so beautiful. So, that, but let yeah. me let me let me show you what happens if you don't do it that way. Mm -hmm. Again, our rated um, part of this is the hitch, mm -hmm. and this is just a connection to the hitch. And it's not—I shouldn't say it's just a connection to the hitch. It adds function to the hitch too. And if that's make yep. sure the camera's pointed, it's pointed yeah. okay. So it adds function, and it's a connection to the rated hitch. That's that's what the hitchhiker does. Mm -hmm. Um, without that extra function, you wouldn't be able to operate a, a normal hitch with just a, a single load on it or anything like that. So if I take this part and I'm not paying any attention, I put it on the rope and now I'm going to connect to it. I could go ahead and I can get this slick pin. I'm not going to put the slick pin through right now because it's a little hard to take off when you when you incorrectly put it on. But let's say I put that through. Well, no, I'll go ahead and do it. So if somebody's not paying attention and they've connected that and you can see the pins all the way through and they're going, oh, that's great. I'm just, you know, talking to the friends or talking to a video and stuff like that. And now I'm going to put the hitch on here, right? Yeah. I put it on upside down. What happens? It won't go. It won't go. It won't fit. I go, oh, crap. We call I, that sailor proof. Yeah, sailor proof. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep, me proof. Yep. So now, and the reason I didn't want to do that is it's really hard to get this pin out um, because that slot is so big. It doesn't collapse it. Yes. Uh, there's a whole procedure for making the slick pin collapse, and it works really well unless you've put it on wrong all right so there that's come off so that doesn't allow that doesn't allow that air um, let's say let's say I put it this way and I go ahead and I put the pin through where it's supposed to be and everything and then I can go ahead and I, I'd, I'd really be you know if you're new at this you know not sure how to do it you do all that and it would function just fine. Well, it wouldn't function just fine. It would function, mm -hmm. but when you start to go and tend it, it's like- It doesn't work right. It doesn't tend very well. Yes. It's not gonna work as well, but again, the connection for your life support is all there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't It doesn't matter. Right. So, um, 
And I, when I said doesn't matter, it matters because you've lost some of the function. You've lost some of the capability of the device. So you so, always want to be able to read it <clears throat> when you're assembling it. Yep. Have have those things facing you. But if it's not, you'll probably you'll probably realize that you've done something um, that wasn't wasn't right. So if you put it on upside down, or if you put it on left or right. Um, you know, you would soon you would soon find your error, and none of those errors are going to be detrimental, um, detrimental or life life threatening errors. Um, so, what other errors? If it's upside down, if it's backwards, that kind of stuff. Here's here's another one, um, and I'm trying to see how I can repeat these, um, and a new user might. So let's say let's say I've done this somehow, Miss, and missed and I missed I missed the rope going through there, so the camera can see where that's not going through there. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know, maybe I <laughs> again I'm I'm trying to fake this like somebody might. Um, so I've gone ahead and um, put that on there, and then I'm going to go ahead and I'll tie my hitch, and it's. And it's going to be kind of hard because I've got to hold all this, but I'm new on this device and haven't paid a lot of attention to my instructors. And so I go ahead and do everything and I'm going, okay, sometimes I do five. Right now I've got one, two, three, four, five wraps. And that seems to work pretty well for me. My rope's broken in. And we'll go over tying this and everything, but I'm just trying to make a point right now that everything's looking really great and I do this and it's like ah, something's something not working very well but nonetheless when I get on rope your hitch is it my hitch is it my life is supported mm -hmm. but when I go to use it I go damn it's not working right. this, that, <clears throat> this doesn't tend very well and then I go ah crap yeah. I, I didn't I didn't feed it properly so to fix that, it's easy enough to take that pin, and I don't have to take the pin all the way out. Mm -hmm. I just take it part of the way out. And then that pin goes back through, and the pin is all the way through. And now, bingo. Now it works great. I'm back to having it. I can work just undo the entire system. Right. Yeah, you didn't have to mistake. undo the whole okay, system, gotcha. but nonetheless, the, the point I'm trying to make is that there's just not a lot of things you can do to mess this thing up. I mean, you there, there's no way you could install it upside down on the rope. Right. Yeah. You'd never you'd never pass a sit thing. Uh, if the if the hitch was down here, yeah. I mean that'd be crazy. But if somebody didn't know what they don't know. What they don't know. As um, long as you understand that as long as the words are up and facing you, you're doing it right. You're doing you'll get the you'll get the most function out of it, but your life is still yep. not in peril. Yep. But you'll get all the function out of it. Um, but you, you're just not going to be very happy with the device. And right. you're going to be asking, you'll either figure it out or you're going to be asking somebody uh, what's what's wrong and why it's not working right. Um, so, now, the same can be said. You can see where I've gotten, I'm starting to get some wear on that sure. dog bone, which is, that's what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Um, I noticed some on the inside of the body yep. too, and that'll wear down in there too. And these are all replaceable parts. Um, but so um, the same can be said for the dog bone. It'd be really hard to connect all this to the rope, but you could connect. Again, you could have this, and you could be connected to the hitch, and not have any of this in place. Okay. Uh, but it's just not going to work at all. Right. It's just going to be like basically hanging, hanging from a hitch. Hanging on a hitch. Um, let's see what else is next on our slick pin versus so, carabiner. Um, yeah. So it doesn't backwards instant miscapture all that kind of stuff. Uh, doesn't. Let me talk about the slick pin versus the carabiner. It's easy to see it. The number of actions for a disconnection failure it takes about nine. So when I'm connected, there's there's just I mean it's not it's not hidden at all. 
mm -hmm. it's really obvious that it has these two pins that are sticking through. This is fairly flush mm -hmm. with that. If for some reason you were doing that, it becomes pretty obvious, uh -huh. doesn't it? That that's yeah. not yeah. there. But you still have, you still one. have one connection right there. So it's pretty obvious. The life support part of this is pretty obvious and pretty um, easy to see. Let me talk about taking this off the rope um, because if I'm going to do a, a redirect and I'm going to toss this around through the tree or advance it through the tree somehow and I disconnect, in this particular instance, I leave this on my rope bridge mm -hmm. and I, it lives on my rope bridge. Some people have a hard time with that and they want the speed of a carabiner. Mm -hmm. um, carabiners are great. I use carabiners, but you have to be conscious of that carabiner that it's always auto locking, that it's constantly loaded properly, uh, it's not getting sideways, all those kind of things. And it's really hard for us tree climbers because we're standing on limbs and stuff. Right now, if I'm standing on a limb, uh, that carabiner might be going sideways. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that some more in a minute. <clears throat> um, but right now, so this care, this slick pin is the the part that connects the hitchhiker body to the rope in order to disconnect this in order for me to have a life-threatening failure um, i have to do about nine actions for this to send me to the ground so somehow um, if i was in the tree somehow all this would have to happen by accident so i have to push that's once mm -hmm. and then i have to push that right so there's two actions right there mm -hmm. and now you can see that the slick pins starting to come out mm -hmm. all right and I don't have to but I'm going to rotate that a little easier for my finger and I'm not counting that as an action here's another one I push the plunger in all right so that plunger has to physically get pushed in mm -hmm. and then I have to push it again so that's four actions that I've done to this point now I'm still life support it'd be a scary life support I wouldn't want to see that if I was up in the tree. No. But I'm still life support connected, right? Mm-hmm. So, in order to get this to come loose, I've got to give that a pull. So that's five, five. actions, mm -hmm. right? So that's five actions. And if you look closely, you'll see now that pin is down inside the slot, the plunger on the slick pin. Mm -hmm. I have to take that plunger because it. It's not going to come anymore, right? It's stuck. Right. That it's locked again. that plunger is again locked on the casing of the hitchhiker. So I have to. What are we? We're at five actions yeah. so far, right? Yeah. So now I have to turn again, and when I turn this, that action will compress the plunger. I don't know if you could see that, but the plunger got compressed. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's six, six mm -hmm. actions, and now it's still life support, mm -hmm. but I have to pull it. Right? Yeah. Yep. And the rope can come out. Yep. But it's still a life, port, life support connection, right? Are you counting the pull or the twist as two separate actions? Or is the yeah, that was a pull, pull and a twist. So, so now we're at seven actions. Seven actions, okay. right? But I'm still connected. Right? Incredibly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not a, again, it, it'd be <clears throat> yeah. scary as shit connection. If I was in the tree hanging on this, that's right. I'd be looking for something else to hold on to. All right. But I'm into seven actions now before I'm starting to fall to the ground, right? Right. So now again, in order to get this one to release, I've got to turn it again, all right? But it's still getting a really scary life support connection, but that's eight, yep. right? And now in order to get it to completely release, I got to pull it again. That's nine actions. Yeah. Wow. Carabiners, again, I climb with a carabiner. Yep but um they take a lot less actions and sometimes if you haven't monitored your carabiner mm -hmm. they can be where they are not auto uh, all the time in fact my last competition i had one of my carabiners that wasn't working properly and i had to oil it and get it to pass a gear inspection and i have seen so many times at gear inspections where carabiners not yeah. automatically closing yeah. yeah what are your thoughts on screw links not Again, those those are for rock climbing guys, and rock climbers are more than welcome to use them. That's what they use. But again, 
that's a screw link with the guy on the belay he's not bumping into stuff he's not dragging that across the limb he's not laying on it in the tree mm -hmm. and so when that gets screwed down it chances are it's probably going to stay screwed down if we use one of those and you go up in the tree next thing you know I'm dragging my ass across the limbs and everything and sometimes that carabiner can be whatever yeah. and it might unscrew itself and because it unscrews itself it doesn't automatically lock right we need something that if for whatever reason we lay on it and it does by chance uh, come open we're hoping that it will automatically close itself so screw link will i'm sorry i was not asking about screw link carabiners just the like you know the delta screw yeah, links they yeah. used to even no, those those are great okay. and i've used them a lot in fact it's in the syllabus right there yeah we'll be you got to make it. sure that they're properly tensioned <clears throat> and some guys will put a wrench on it and i guarantee you that most of them will over tension it mm -hmm. which which compromises some of the strength but it won't come off and depending on the size of the carabiner i can do that with my gloves but you're pretty safe doing it with a wrench all the time um but again do it with a wrench in fact that's one option when you're setting up alpine butterfly if you don't want to use it my preference is a cookie um someplace i have my cookies yeah we have to take a break enough to get rid of some of my gear put together <laughs> um but yeah so uh a screw a screw uh link but yeah, screwing uh, a, a screw gate carabiner, I see usually a bad idea. Okay. Anyway, so it takes nine actions in order for me to f fall to the ground. Um, so again, if I if I were to miss that, it it would still be a life support connection. It just wouldn't function right. So I'd want to make sure that it's all the way through. It's easy drops. Drops all the way through. Um, you'd have to be really distracted not to not to see that go through. And once that's connected, um, and again, this is an advantage with the with the hitchhiker with the swing arm on here. Mm -hmm. There's very little impact. I'm going to talk about this more, but there's le very little impact from the fact that my system is not taut right now. Mm -hmm. um, if this flops around, if this goes sideways, it goes upside down. It there's self, no side loading potential. It self orients. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, it wouldn't recommend it, but if you ever do get in a, in a situation where you're dragging this across the branch or something like that, you know, it, it'll kind of it'll it, self orient. Uh huh. And you don't have really sensitive linkages here that are susceptible to bending or breakage. Right. Um, Again, just very simple. And so, let me see what's on this a little bit next. Uh, example of a snap or a sticking carabiner. Yeah. So, um, in fact, I, mm. let's pause the camera for a minute. Let me go get my screw link. Battery is like 50%. So, let me just make a point. Okay. Um, this is. This is a double acting snap. You've got to push here and then get it to open. Mm -hmm. The triple action, I, I did a little video on this the other day about lanyards. It's got another little component right there. And then um, it takes, you have to push here and then push there to open the gate. Mm -hmm. But if you're not careful, um, that this part can actually ride up on the other part and it'll leave the, it'll leave the gate open. Ooh. And again, someplace I've left that laying around and then don't see it on here okay. um, but anyway so so that's to be said about the snaps and then again with it with a carabiner this is not a captive eye but if I'm if I connect to my climbing device and this thing is allowed just to move around as soon as I stand on a limb you know you're not quite sure how that's gonna go and they are auto locking but if if they're not maintained or if they're not monitored they can get where they don't automatically lock and you'll see videos of guys oftentimes uh, demonstrating where they're bumped up the tree just right and the tree will kind of push and open that up wow so i'm not saying that that's not safe i'm just saying that with this i don't have any of those concerns yeah um and even if you take a captive eye carabiner um, 
and put that. I've seen the captive eye, this will jump out and then get down, it'll bend that little thing <coughs> and messes it all up and stuff and you're kind of screwed. But, but even with that, um, it's just, I hate flop. I do not like things flopping around that can affect my life support. Mm -hmm. This can flop around like we demonstrated over this. This can d s flop around and it'll self-orient and I, I really think for that reason it's got a lot going for it. For a secondary system, um, I will, we'll demonstrate that, but for a secondary system this works out really well because I can take this and I can put it on my bridge uh -huh. or I can take it and I can put it on the, you know, the climbing line there and there, make a yep. a, a separate suspension, doubled suspension. I can take it and I can put it on my D's, all those kind of things. It's just that now this has that that can open mm -hmm. without me knowing about it. In fact, right now, look at that. I've got this to stay open. And it didn't lock all the way? It didn't lock all the way. Interesting. And so, I mean, they have to be watched. And so I should get this Clean. uh, cleaned out. And sometimes it's just, you know, there it goes. Yep. Um, it's a fail. So, you know, it's just, and this is what I've been using for a secondary system. So inspecting it now, I go, oh, we got to go blow this out before I, mm -hmm. before I uh, do that. So, um, all right, let me look at what's next on our syllabus. So that's about the captive eye. Um, and it's a hitch-based system. I think we've talked about that. Um, we all like hitch. And, yeah, it, it's, uh, that's the life support. I'm gonna take this, this ring off. Before I do, this is, this is another option. If, um, there's all kinds of options, and in the manual, you'll see some other options that people can employ um, if they um, if they don't want to use that captive eye. There's other types of pulleys and or, uh, swivels and everything else. But if somebody didn't want to have this extra part on their bridge, they can go ahead and put that on their bridge. If, if you're okay with just having a ring, and I don't know why anybody would have a, a problem with some things hanging on their bridge, but um, that offers a similar performance. Yep. You know, and without having to have the swing arm that's yep. living on your bridge. And we'll talk about the anchor point and stuff like that, but again, you can you can anchor right off, right off of the ring and have a similar functionality. Um, but I prefer myself to have uh, that non-captive eye, the non, uh, uh, the captive eye uh, for that right there. So I'm going to take that off for a minute. We have choices. Yeah, and because this is uh, my secondary, I'm okay. I'm okay with that um, being easy on and off. Mm -hmm. right. On and off my uh, <clears throat> on my bridge, but let me take. I'm gonna take that ring off because I'm not gonna use it that way. But I just wanted to demonstrate what that would look like doing it that way. And again, my my favorite thing is a rope bridge. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to uh, make those connections, but. The rope bridge sure works well. Without the swivel, do you feel any more restricted on the captive eye on your bridge, or you can still twist and turn as much as you like, and it's not a big deal? Uh, yeah, you you can, but you know sometimes I'll find that I have to step over my rope. Okay. You know, SRT and stuff like that. Just the way I'm going, if I'm going to be twisted around. Because otherwise, yeah, you can get in a position where it does that. I see. And that still works, but now it's not very comfortable and stuff, and it doesn't doesn't right. function. So when you to avoid that, when you do some kind of a redirect or something like that, you might find that you just have to step around your rope. Gotcha. You know. Yeah. Or have a swivel. 
Right. Okay. Um, and you know, in that case, but um, in fact, you could do if somebody wanted to, they could do that other configuration mm -hmm. with that DMM swivel mm -hmm. that allows for all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. you know, people yeah, would be okay right. with having that swivel live on their bridge, and then use that different. That's why there's two different swing arms. Right. So you can choose the which, captive which eye. Which play you want to go. Or the non-captive eye. Right. But I just really advocate that people don't bypass those options by adding a carabiner to this. Yes. And just kind of um, circumventing the whole the whole point. Right. So, um, all right, so what was, I forgot. You notice that, Peter? I forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> That's quite okay. <laughs> it's a hitch gauge yeah, system yeah, as trustworthy as the blade. Oh, there's, so there's no eye. There's no eye on this. Um, and once in a while, I'll get somebody, they'll say, well, can we can we design this dog bone so that it takes the traditional eye, right? Mm. If, you're, if you're using a hitch climber pulley or whatever, you have, you have eyes on that hitch cord. Mm-hmm. And so they they're like, well, let's design a dog bone that has that so I can use those eyes. And I go again, you're taking the beauty of the thing and throwing it all away, because because I'm not subject to using the end right there. Yes. I can make an infinite or almost infinite number of adjustments to the length of this. Right. And. If, for example, the hitch I'm using, it starts to put maybe a little bit of concentrated wear on one little spark part of this hitch, uh -huh. now I can take, and I can take my double overhand knot on this side, uh -huh. and I can retie it and just move it a half an inch. Right. And moving it that half an inch, I've taken that wear spot and I've put it to a nowhere spot. Mm -hmm. And I can increase the life of my hitch tremendously just by those that by that small adjustment mm -hmm. and um whereas your eye to eye cord once it's worn on that spot you're done yeah right you're done with it and right. not only that you can't adjust the length to put to put an eye on there just defeat the whole to, yeah. to defeat the whole point um yeah so you know and the stopper knots are easy easy to see mm -hmm. they're right in front of your face all the time mm -hmm. um there's, you know, you want to have uh, about a five diameter length on the tail. Mm -hmm. And when we build these, we put a little bit of um, super glue on the very end. And it also provides an mm. opportunity. I can sharpen this just like a pencil. Oh yeah. And it makes it a little easier going through the, through the dog bone. Uh, but it also, if for some reason it was getting pulled into the end of the knot it just provides a spot that doesn't want to go get pulled through right gotcha. so it keeps it and those those things really only apply when the knot is not under tension because mm -hmm. if it's under tension it's not going to get pulled. Right. i mean it failure point it would but um so there's a, just a whole bunch of advantages to not having an eye on your friction cord and not only that the expense when i when you go to buy a eye to eye it's going to cost a lot mm -hmm. this is four and a half feet i use four and a half feet um four and a half feet of hitch cord mm -hmm. that's all it is for yeah. a, a dollar a foot or whatever right you know a uh, buck 50 a foot depending on what you're what you're getting and stuff like that um but yeah so it just you know there's no eye another great advantage yeah. to the hitchhiker. um yeah so adjustments to the wear uh, the low exposure. We talked about this. Um, let me let me grab. Well, and no, I won't. But um, so a lot of the fully mechanical devices usually have what I call is a big top. I mean, they, they just have to have a big top. There's there's either a lever action up there. There's something up there that increases that exposure. Yeah. Um, with a hitch cord and if something there, hits that you're going for a ride yeah you could depend especially if it's not weighted right now it's not weighted very much mm -hmm. so if something were to come and slide down the top if i had my unisender on here mm -hmm. and i'll talk about the unisender because i love it and i sell it mm -hmm. um, but if i'm standing here and it's unweighted and something comes down or even my chest ascender or the sleeve of my jacket or anything snags on the top of that thing which is easy to do when it's not under tension yeah. 
and what I'm standing on disappears, mm -hmm. then it and I are going to go for a ride. Mm -hmm. And I hate it when you see somebody laying on the ground next to their multi sender, looking up in the tree, wondering why they just fell out of the tree and their device is still connected to the rope. Yeah. It's like, well, you didn't use it right. I mean, that can happen. Mm -hmm. It's not just because it's connected to the rope doesn't mean it's not going to slide down the rope with you. I can force this thing to slide. I mean, that's how it works. Yeah. Is I push down on the top and I and I am able to go down the rope. It's just because that has such uh, a smaller footprint and it's, you know, much more difficult for anything to get caught on there mm -hmm. than it is on a lever and stuff like that. So the exposure that comes from that is just is much is reduced much reduced yes thank you for helping me talk <laughs> um so what what i want to talk about right now let me get this on the camera right here i want to talk about slack versus a taut climbing line for srt versus doubled moving rope um there's some there's some ANSI requirements that we don't allow um slack to get into our system this is Z133. If we're working arborists that choose to comply with yeah. the regulations, they talk about not having slack. And most people, if you ask why that is, they will tell you that they don't want to subject your device to a shock load. Right. It goes beyond that because it's that lack of slack that keeps your device properly configured as well. Tensions. And in the, in the uh, TCI climbing competition rule book, there's uh, a discretionary uh, point. There's discretionary points that can turn into a disqualification for not maintaining a taunt climbing system. It says failure to maintain a taut climbing system or climbing above the tie-in point. Mm -hmm. And again, when they say climbing above the tie-in point, most people would go, yeah, that's because we want to avoid the shock load. Again, it's not just avoiding the shock load. It's keeping your device properly configured. With the Hitchhiker XF with the swing arm, if there is not tautness in my climbing system, it will self-orient. It's, it's probably, well, it's the only device I know of on the market that will, that will protect us from that. Mm. When I say the climbing system, when, when we're trying to make sure that this climbing system is taut, what are, we, what are, what are the components of the climbing system? the the hitch the device okay. the bridge <coughs> in in assembly on your on rope on rope so you pretty much nailed it so it's the bridge connection to my harness mm -hmm. my ass mm -hmm. right and it goes through the device and the hitch and our rope mm -hmm. i would just add the rope to what you just talked that's mm -hmm. that's our climbing system that's what's keeping us safe and so when i'm standing on a limb it's pretty hard with most devices. Right now, do I have any tautness? No. It's, and some would say that's slack. Right. Mm -hmm. And there is a little bit of difference between having a system that's slack and having one that's just not taut. Right. Mm -hmm. And some tautness, some tautness, now I have some tautness in there, right? I can yes. feel it. I can feel it on my butt back here. Yep. I have some tautness. Notice how it keeps everything oriented. Yep. That's really important for most of our climbing devices. I have videos of guys that have not maintained that. In fact, there's one example that I can think of. Um, the guy was moving off of a redirect, kind of changing the system and stuff like that. So he was laying onto his device, Ooh. Um, which was a, a hitch-based device. He was on a hitch climber pulley uh, or a... Whatever. I don't want to talk about other, right. but anyway, so he was, he was laying on that device and you can see him take the slack. He was laying on it like this and you can see where he took this, took the slack out, mm -hmm. but in doing so, he never took out all, all, he never tensioned the device completely. And so when he stepped onto it and he was laying on it, how is any of this going to engage? And it may also have impacted, he had a, a chest harness. And if that chest harness is laying on, there was, it was a device that also has a mechanical function to it. 
So with that bigger top mechanical function laying on top of that hitch, when he was laying on that, and then he let go to move on, it turned into a fall. Yeah. And he didn't come out of that fall until just by chance, he rotated around as he was falling, probably again with his rock climbing experience, he was all comfortable with that. He was like, okay, I'm falling out of the tree. But you know, the, the other thing we suffer with is if we're falling out of the tree, it may not be the ground that kills us. It right. might be that big old limb that's underneath us that we fall onto that's gonna really hurt us. Um, but anyway, so when he rotated around and started coming this way, well now this could start to get some tautness and back into the system. And as soon as that had tautness, all of that stuff was able to re-engage. And after, I don't know, 35 feet or so, it caught him and he didn't hit the ground and everybody was everybody was okay uh, but nonetheless it would be an awful scary experience but that that speaks to the difference between a taunt system and a system that doesn't have slack in it it's, there is a difference and it mostly has to do with that configuration again going back to the rock climbing um, scenario this guy the belay guy he's maintaining some tauntness in that system mm -hmm. Let me mention too, the difference between SRT and doubled moving rope. Um, this is not long enough for me to establish a doubled moving rope, but we'll, we'll do that with something else. Right now, if I start rope walking, and I'm, I won't get on rope, but if I start doing this and I'm tending my device and I start up the rope, is my system taunt? No. Yeah, right. No. It's not. Mm -mm. This is taunt. This is kind of like, yeah, nothing going on here. This rope bridge, it, not too much, especially, and you'll notice I tighten it up, but if I didn't tighten it up, then it's really not taunt, mm -hmm. right? And when you talk, you ask me about uh, adjustable bridges and stuff, mm -hmm. while I'm on that subject, to build tauntness back into my system because I don't always ro walk, uh, rope walk with a hitchhiker. I might be rope walking with some other device that's more susceptible to not being taunt, right? So I can build tauntness with my adjustable tending device and I can also tighten that up. So now, although the hitchhiker is, is not taunt mm -hmm. it actually does have some tauntness because this is actually pulling down on my on my harness right there so the system immediately locks when you is kind of coming in and then that <laughs> self rotates yep. and and engages mm -hmm. um, but if I'm climbing on a device that doesn't have the swing arm um, I can build some tauntness into that SRT device by having an adjustable um, tending device and having an adjustable bridge. So although I may not use that adjustable bridge a lot, um, if I'm climbing on a device that is more susceptible to being non-taut, then I can I can correct that with those adjustments that I have right here. And some devices, you know, if I'll put on a different device, it, uh, you know, because of the length of the device, it all just gives me the ability to move this anywhere I want it on my chest, right. including down here. And then there's also the advantage if you're if you're rope walking, you can tighten that up and it gives you more stability and stuff. But I don't find that being um, that being a major uh, factor. But it's just something. But anyway, so that does that make sense when it comes to slack and tautness? Absolutely. So when we're watching or when we're teaching climbers. Um, teach them that there is a difference between the slack and the tautness mm -hmm. and it's a challenge to make sure that you maintain some tautness in your climbing system um, and depending on how susceptible the device is uh, then it's really important that somebody watches it mm -hmm. um, most often you'll hear the thing about if it's slack you know in a comp it's like if they they said okay if that if that loop goes below your knee you got to fix that. Okay. But look at that. I mean, that's still everything's everything's not taught. No. 
sure. it, it, that slack may not technically go below my knee but but, it's but you're still, still going to go for a, yeah, a hard still stop no pretty quickly yeah um that, that's going to be a jolt that's not an let me um and how can i demonstrate this best there is a difference we can maybe we'll just talk about it there's a difference when you're doubled moving rope um that rope goes up and comes back and connects and my hitchhiker will be a bad example for that because it takes care of that tautness it takes care of that slack on its own but on other devices say the hitch climber pulley and uh, a friction hitch right mm -hmm. um, you have both ends that come and connect to your rope bridge or your anchor point on your harness as soon as you have two parts of that then there's going to be some tautness in your system mm -hmm. Uh, it, it just it's a little bit different with doubled moving rope than it is with SRT. SRT is much more susceptible to having slack and even to a greater extent having that non tautness in your in your system. Yes. Does that make sense? It makes perfect so, sense. I mean that's really important and I've seen I've seen falls for that. And you you can't rope walk and have tautness in your system. I mean, it just, it's really hard. And not hard. have tautness in your system. Huh? And not have not tautness. Have, and not have, right, have right. yeah, it's just part of, and you can you can mitigate a lot of it by having an adjustable bridge and adjustable here, but on most devices, somewhere in there, because you're having to lift this up with your harness, mm -hmm. it's gonna have some non-tautness. Mm -hmm. And our backup for that is what? Our knee ascender and our exactly. foot ascender. Mm -hmm. So if if for some reason my foot ascender comes off, then I'll have my knee ascender. Right. If whatever, if if for whatever reason you have those two things, that knee ascender will come up and lock up underneath my multi sender and keep me from turning into a pretzel. Right. So um, let me just mention we kind of mentioned this before, but on most most devices, it's really important. Uh, mechanical devices will have a spring located someplace in that device uh, that provides the bias for engagement. Um, that's a vertical spring. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any mechanical device that doesn't somehow, somehow have a spring that pushes vertically to make things engage, right? Mm -hmm. So again, this uh, speaks to the vulnerability of a fully mechanical device because those springs are not meant to be very strong they're just meant to provide some bias so that there'll be an engagement on that portion of the device that's supposed to add friction um, anything vertically can disengage those <clears throat> quite well or quite easily the friction hitch on the other hand its tension it does have a spring it's just not a mechanical spring but it's the spring in the way that we've tied our hitch yeah. and you know how tight you tie your hitch um, can can have a bearing on that but it's it's a spring tension that wraps 360 degrees around the rope much less much less vulnerable than um, a mechanical device when it comes to the direction of that bias spring mm -hmm. and again this has a spring there's spring action inside that hitch and I, again, I, I can control that. Right now, this this works really well. But if I got up there, I would lanyard in and watch how easy it is for me to adjust that spring tension. You can't adjust the spring tension on a mechanical device. I just tighten that up a little bit mm -hmm. and then I'll retie this. This is a stevedore knot. This is like taking the mechanical spring out of your mechanical device and getting yourself a stronger one. Mm -hmm. I've just, you know, yep. bingo. And I've put a new, better spring in there, right? And a stiffer spring. A stiffer spring, yep. And somebody else would go, yeah, but I really want one that tends really well. So take it out and adjust it. All right. Um, we talked about stevedore. Yeah, this is a stevedore. We'll We'll practice tying that stevedore. It works really well for that side yeah. of the dog bone. Yeah. Um, so um, we talked about how if the rope flattens, 
then it has minimal effect because your controllable friction is wrapped all the way around. So if there is some flattening on this rope, mm -hmm. because the rope's coming all the way around it, it's numerous gonna times, it's gonna adhere. much, much lower uh, effect. Um, so let me talk about the um, multiple configurations. All right, so I'm gonna set this uh, up and this is gonna be one of our scenarios and I'll just cover it right now. So this is, this is a scenario where I have just enough climbing line that it comes up and then comes back down, right? Um, if I wanted, I could set this up as a doubled moving rope because mm -hmm. I, I got both ends. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of options and I'll cover some more of the options with the retrieval. If I was doing a aerial rescue and it was really important that I get on rope as quickly as I could, I probably wouldn't bother with the retrieval function. But um, right now I'm just going to send this up. It's non-retrievable. Uh oh. Right? Okay. So we'll send that up. So somebody's got to go get it later. Yep. We're gonna we're gonna climb up and get it, and I'm gonna put this on, um, and I'll cover this. This is a procedure that I follow, and you should probably teach it um, for getting on rope, mm -hmm. um, and it covers some. It keeps people from making some major errors, but this is hanging on my harness. I wouldn't walk around like, like this a lot with it, but nonetheless, it's it's there, and it's it's not gonna it's not gonna fall off. So I do a I do a little safety knot. Mm -hmm. I just tie a mm -hmm. that gives that gives something for my hitchhiker to sit on. And then I walk up and I put that on. And at this point, I'll make sure that my pin is all the way in. Mm -hmm. And again, it's really easy to feel it, see it. Uh, there's there's just no doubt about that that's fully engaged, right? And then then I'll take my hitch cord. And you put that through, we talked about it's difficult to make an ear. And this is tying the Catalan, modified Catalan. We'll talk about that. Notice that it's sitting down. If you wanna come in a little closer to the hitch, you'll notice that when I pull down on this, it's all kind of sitting down on the top of that hitch hiker. Yep. And it's all being held up by this little safety knot. Just makes it easier to tie. And then I start doing my wraps. And again, my thumb is right here, so I can I can hold that tautness in the wraps. And I we've talked about five or six wraps or whatever your weight is, you know, sort it out. So there's one, two, three, four, five. I'll go with five wraps and because I'm gonna check it and make sure that it's good. And now it's just easy to put that through there. And with the stevedore, Again, I'm tying up into the hitch so I'm not losing anything in my tension. And after you've done it a few times, you'll kind of get aware, um, and I'm sure you guys are already aware of about what kind of tension you like to climb with. Mm -hmm. um, now, one thing I made a mistake on early in my journey was I counted that bottom under wrap as mm -hmm. one of my wraps and I really only had five. And I could, that could be, but that, that could be why, you know, you ended up a little short and you got that creep. Yep, exactly. That creeped you to the ground and creeped you out and stuff like that. So whatever, whatever works for a climber, at, at my weight, 200 pounds, mm -hmm. this works for me. Mm -hmm. It would probably be too much for some of you guys, a lighter, lighter climbers. Sorry, I'm uh, with you. I'm about the same place Heavier you climbers. <laughs> it just it just works, but it's so easy to make that adjustment and makes this tend really well. While I'm thinking about it, let me just show you something. New climbers may be a little apprehensive about a hitch engaging and stuff because we want we want our hitch to engage, mm -hmm. right? If if you're to that point, this is this is what I call a distal tuck. Okay. When we talk about I don't know if we want to demonstrate tying a distal hitch, but a distal has where you go underneath it like that. And that's, you were looking at that other one going, this doesn't look the same. Uh -huh. the, the innovation hitch has basically just a whole bunch of wraps and then it goes through twice like that. It tends to engage more, 
I hate to say reliably because I found the Catalan to be very reliable. Yeah. But if somebody's a little apprehensive, they're kind of new, maybe they have some other things going on, they just want to make sure that's, that'll help the engagement. Okay. It also will start to lock up a little bit and get to be too tight mm -hmm. for somebody that's doing a lot of limb walking. Okay. So there'll be some point where they go, hey, this is starting to, uh, you know, it's not tending as well as I would like. Mm -hmm. You've gotten some more experience, ditch. Ditch the, the diesel. The diesel tuck. Under, it's, so it's just an under tuck. It's on the just top, an right? under tuck on the top. Okay. Right, and that that'll help with engagement. I don't, I don't climb with it that way. You know. In fact, I found that the, the straight innovation hitch that has two of those tucks, mm -hmm. um, just it, it doesn't perform as well as the Catalan, the modified Catalan. Okay. Um, but it is probably a little more positive with the engagement. So, so you're referencing modified Catalan. What's the difference? Uh, if if you look at a regular Catalan, it won't have it won't come down in a straight leg. Oh. Um, it'll come down and it does another little tuck up underneath here. Okay. The problem with that is whenever you have another binding part of your hitch that's mm -hmm. down here, you've taken away all of this adjustability right here. I can't mm -hmm. I can't pull that tension I that I like to have in there right and you'll hear people say when the hitch stretches out it starts to get the hitch this cordage is not really stretching out we, right. we know that but what happens is it starts to conform itself to the climbing rope a little bit more and so what starts out being uh, rather tight what starts out being rather tight um, starts to get uh, a little more open mm -hmm. but again it's it's really easy to lanyard in and with that stevedore knot it makes it just really easy to put in a little bit more, more snug tension it mm -hmm. yeah just snug it up and put a little more tension in on that um, another thing I'll mention I don't think it's in the syllabus you'll see people if they're new with the hitchhiker they'll try to push it up this way yeah no, it's not. It's, yeah, that's, yeah. it's designed not to work Uppercut. that way. Uppercut. Yeah. If you if you do that, what you're doing is actually engaging this proportional friction. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. If for some reason you find yourself in the tree and you don't want to connect your tending device, you're only going to go up two feet or whatever. Mm -hmm. Grab it from the swing arm and lift it up. Ooh, okay. It will disengage that pin down there. But if I'm not disengaging that pin. I can pull on this all day long and I'm just making it work the way it's supposed to work. Well, an, an uppercut works the same way this way, right? Or yeah, no? I mean, that's that's yeah. tending the device. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I haven't, I haven't sat on this yet to, right. to right. set the hitch, mm -hmm. so it's really tight. But yeah, that's the same thing, because when I do that, mm -hmm. that automatically lifts the pin. Yeah. There we go. And disengages the pin. Perfect. Just like this disengages the pin. Okay. But this, grabbing the body, engages the pin okay mm. so you'll see you'll see guys and they try to do that and they'll be frustrated like, how come this thing won't move right i just want it to move because i want to step up on the next branch it's like you just gotta you gotta do it from down here that's yeah. the way that's well the way we teach works. the uppercut with our moving rope yeah so well, right. we'll teach I mean, that same move and... that's the tending thing yeah exactly. but you will find you will find sometimes if you're just standing around and you're not going to go very far it you know you can go either way okay so I find that and it's particularly helpful if I'm I'll just demonstrate this without actually being <clears throat> if if I'm just gonna go maybe a step up or something like that mm -hmm. and I don't want to connect my tending device mm -hmm. I can't do that now right Ah, yeah. So okay. if if I'm if I'm standing on my rope, yep. And maybe maybe I'm standing on my rope and I just want that to be a little higher. Uh -huh. You know how you are when you're getting in position and things like that. Yeah. And you still have tension down here. Just the swing arm up. Re yeah. Just releases no and swing up you go. arm. Swing arm up. I like that. That's yeah. a good turn. Swing arm up. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, talking about the numerous configurations. Um. I'm going to walk up and hopefully we can get a video of that from down here because I'm not at a lower point. Um, so, oh, I know what I was going to do. Let's cover this right now. So we've connected the hitchhiker to the rope. 
-hmm. and it's all ready to go. Okay. It is possible, and this is this is part of um, rope walking. Is it's possible to walk up this rope without having any of this stuff connected, right? Yes. I can put my foot ascender on. Mm -hmm. I probably have a little bit of a problem with my knee ascender because I'd be looking to attach here, but. For whatever reason, you're not maybe not on a hitchhiker. You're on some other device, and you just we've had we've had somebody do this and end up hanging inverted oh. um, because they didn't actually have anything connected, and they started walking up the rope on their knee and foot ascender on their knee and foot ascender with no device, uh -huh, and then realized oh oh crap, you know, <laughs> and they're holding on with both hands. So how do they disconnect? Oh my god. Their knee and foot ascender when they're hanging with both hands. Eventually they ended up inverted. Yep. And they were close enough to the ground and they were able to call a neighbor to help them. But if if your head's two oh feet off the ground, you yeah. can still die that way. You still oh, yeah. die that way. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're sixty feet up or two feet off the ground, you're yeah. gonna die from inversion, whatever you call it. Yeah. Right? Nine minutes, I think it's a standard. Yes, there's all kinds of but I've seen movies where they hang them for twenty four hours and come back and you know, it's just a torture thing. That's that's movie life. Oh. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I've I've put this on. That's that's done and I'm gonna test my hitch. All right? Back give fit. it a pull. I go, yeah, okay, I like that. And I usually I usually give it a, a couple. Uh -huh. And now, like you said, I can tend it. Uh -huh. And I'll sit on it one more time. And I, I kind of just make sure it's not creeping. Right. I like it. It's working for me really good. And and that's good. And later on it's it's gonna it's gonna set in a little bit better for me and stuff. But anyway, so I go, okay, that's supporting my life. I've checked the hitch mm -hmm. and everything else. Um, so, next thing I'll probably do is connect the tending and my foot ascender. And now I'll take a step. And again, this is a check on my hitch and on that and on my tending device. And I'll look up and I'll check my anchor and stuff. You know, back in uh, Blake's Hitch era and Peter developed the, the back system and all that kind of stuff, it was great. We don't have a carabiner, so there's some modifications for that kind of a procedure. Mm -hmm. But if somebody will do this every time, and again, what I like about this, this is not terribly comfortable right now, but if I were to pass out, Your I, heads would be, up. I would be heads up, I'd be fine. Yep. Yeah. So I our back check neck. still works because we can use this as the carabiner. The the what works? Our, we use the, Peter's back check, right? Yeah. Belt, anchor, carabiner, knot. Okay, if you want to do that, call that a carabiner. Yeah, that, yeah I know, that, I know. If you want to still use that, <laughs> uh, it's, cool. that's yep. just great. I mean, whatever whatever works. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but if you get on a rope and you kind of take a moment, you will also notice if my leg loop wasn't connected. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't sit here right now, if my leg loop wasn't connected, my ass would be hanging out this way. Yeah. And I'd realize, I, I would notice that this isn't connected. You can almost sit back a little bit and if that was really loose. But you know, you feel all those connections, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're there. Um, and then of course, the next thing I'll do is take my, this is a foldable socket. Um, and again, this is, we'll talk about that backup. Right now, if I were to disengage this, I'm only gonna go down that far. Yeah, you and still have slack to get out. That's not comfortable, but imagine yes. this old guy, if I went to where my foot was there, <laughs> oh man, I'd be, yeah. I'd be crying in pain. Oh, yeah. I'd probably be, you know, I'd really need some help. But with that, that's gone up underneath my multi-sender, Again, I'm not comfortable. I would really be pissed at myself for whatever I did to allow them, but that's a backup. Yeah. This is a backup. This is a backup. That keeps me from falling to my death, uh -huh. but it probably just gives me a slow death. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if I want to fall to my death or have a slow death either. But this. I like that because you can still build slack into this to get out of here. Yeah. This just makes me feel uncomfortable. Yes. 
but I'm still, I'm, I'm right here and everything. Even if I didn't have the strength to pull myself up, and I think most people climbing a rope are gonna have enough strength to, to stand up here and pull themselves back up. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that that's just an important thing to get, to get all those ducks in a row before you start going up the rope. Beautiful. So now that I've got that, so what I'm gonna do to show the multiple um, configurations and how easy it is to change, mm -hmm. I'm gonna climb up there and all I'm gonna do is connect that end of the climbing line uh -huh. into my device and I'll be right back. You got 7% battery to make that happen. All right, we better, we better quit talking and make that happen. 6%. 6%. That might be more percent than I've got climbing <laughs> up the road. So I'll walk up, I'll take my knee ascender off, and again with the foldable Sokka, I can just take this and make it all disappear because I don't like to have that stuff hanging on me while I'm doing other stuff. Tending device comes off. I would consider putting my lanyard on right now mm -hmm. if I wasn't... Put a lanyard in. And if I was, that would just keep me closer to the tree when I fell, wouldn't it? Yep. <laughs> yep. You'd slide. So with that in mind, I'll put this on suspension points. There you go. All right, so that's on a suspension point. Now I can come off with my foot ascender and to switch over to doubled moving rope, I just take the carabiner to the sewn eye and I'm ready to load that. Lanyard comes off. And look at how easy it was to make that switch. Yep. Now you're moving rope. Now I'm on a moving rope. Beautiful work. Um, this is I'm the clipping. not going to be. Yeah. So I take that off. <clears throat> no more moving rope. I didn't have to. Yep. I didn't have to untie my anchor. I didn't have to disconnect anything. All I had to do was connect the other part of my moving rope to make it a moving rope. Um, all right. What we have is some other configurations. Uh, I don't know. They're like 30 minutes and they're older batteries, so. Okay. While we're talking about that, let me just let me just mention that again because you were talking about it. So this area is kind of a sacred area to me when it comes to being close to my multi-sender and stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you're leaning into it, something can snag on there, that mm -hmm. kind of concept. Mm -hmm. um, this it would have to be up here someplace to snag, probably much less likely than if it was right here where everything, everything lives. Um, and then when I'm done with it, I like things that have multiple uses. It just becomes yeah. suspenders. I like that a lot. On my harness. So, and and as you notice when I set up my rope walking system, this is just really easy to put. We talked about the tautness. Mm -hmm. This is really easy to put tautness into my climbing system, uh, just with a single pull there. Whether I have to match it with anything going on my bridge or not, uh, it just you know this great versatility and mm -hmm. functionality and stuff and so all right so
when when you're pulling these pins out let me demonstrate this too this has got a slick pin keeper it's a nylon um, piece that we make that keeps if if I hold this down right now and because it's not in the device let me <clears throat> let me do it in the device the way it, that it would be that keeps me from dropping that so when I'm coming out of the device, I do the push and the pin and the pull and everything. If I just pull this out like this, do my twists and everything, it comes out and I'm going to completely come off because right now I could take the rope out yeah. and whatever. But if I, if I want to um, take the device completely off, that pin has to come out like that. The slick pin keeper keeps that from Dropping falling, around. falling away. If you're pulling that out, and you inadvertently are holding down that slick pin keeper mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. then I can take the pin all the way out. Oh, wow. Now I can drop the pin. Yes, you can. So when you're taking that pin in or out, don't hold it. And that will just, it'll, it'll I have to turn it, that catches it. Okay. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if your thumb's on there, you can bypass that. Cool. And I'm all locked back in. So I'll do my little. Look at that. Rope walk again. Round two. So I'll put on a foot ascender. Put on my tending device. This is where I snug it up. Mm -hmm. And I like to see minimal slack in my system. Take a step. I've already tested my system. Sit back on it. I like it check everything Le laying back like that makes it a little easier for me to find my socket back there take my socket out and up the rope I'm ready to go let me uh, let me mention this too while I'm while I'm here notice that I connect my socket with the lowest point of my multi sender Again, this area up here is kind of a sacred area to me, and I want to concentrate on keeping that as clear as I can. I don't have a belay guy watching this all the time. It's me. Mm -hmm. I've got to watch this. And so connecting my knee ascender to the bottom of my multi sender means that I don't have anything that goes from my functionality of my feet above my multi sender. If I pulled it over my chest or attach it to my chest if i put it over my back if i do anything like that it's going to go up past my multi-sender and if you have a multi-sender that has levers and arms and things sticking out mm -hmm. who's to say that bungee's not going to come loose or whatever disconnects swings around snags on the top takes you to the ground right okay so when i walk my foot ascender is limited in travel by coming up to the multi or the knee ascender, right? Mm -hmm. And what what's the limiting part of my knee ascender? To the bottom of the hitchhiker. To the bottom of my multi sender. Yeah. And so with a soccer, I can keep all my leg activity down where my legs are. Mm -hmm. Nothing comes above where my legs are. Again, just kind of keeping things clean, mm -hmm. keeping things oriented and you know you can't you can't do that unless you have have this right so anyway so foot ascender foot ascender comes up to the knee ascender knee ascender comes up to the multi sender and and they don't get mixed up no i mean i'm i scheduled the whole day for it anyway so okay, great. um all right, I was going to make a point. Um, Dragging tail. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. I was going to say, when it comes to setting an anchor, um, all right, let's do this. Uh, there's there's another part in there where it talks about the scenarios for um, setting an anchor. So okay. there's basically um, three scenarios that you'll find when using, I use shorter ropes mm -hmm. because I use a, um, a separate retrieval line mm -hmm. 
I can use shorter ropes. Mm -hmm. I have a hundred, I generally climb on a 150 foot rope. Mm -hmm. That'd be equivalent of somebody having a 300 foot rope. Mm -hmm. But I have 150 feet of rope and then I have a 100 feet of retrieval line, basically. Mm -hmm. And so for this example, the length doesn't matter. But um, one example is when, when I set my rope and I have one uh, anchor point available, and then I have a whole bunch of climbing line laying on the on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. um, if I were to send uh, tie just a regular alpine butterfly, I could do that, and then I could pass this end mm -hmm. through that alpine butterfly. Um, if I tied the alpine butterfly on this end, then I'd have to go find find the end there. Um, the other the other thing I can do with this, depending on how much rope I have, um, I can tie this running alpine butterfly. So if I had a whole bunch of rope right there, mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to keep my anchor point right. over here, right. then I'll tie either a running alpine butterfly or an alpine butterfly. It just opens up. And then you can adjust the size of this eye. If I was gonna, like that, that one example, I had to pull my uh, throw bag through there, I can tie it with a bigger eye. Mm -hmm. um, generally, if it's just a regular anchor, that's about the size of the eye. I'll never send a quickie up that goes really high or goes out of sight. I love the quickie and I'll talk about those, but um, I'll never do that for the initial for the initial anchor because there's too many things that can go out of sight and can be what I don't, what I, there's too much distance traveled from the time I put that quickie on to the time it arrives at where I want it to be. So uh, that goes on and then I take my retrieval side and I'll send this up for the retrieval line, right? Mm -hmm. Now the other option, the other option I have when both ends are on the ground, mm -hmm. um, I can put... Make a continuous loop. Make a continuous loop. And, you know, there's there's always debate, debate about if you create a continuous loop like this, can somebody climb up the other side? Ooh. And... Um, like for a rescue or something? Yeah, if you your girlfriend friend or something gets stuck up there and you want to go give them a hand as long as that anchors supports your weight there's no reason I can't put another climbing system on here and and go up and give them a bit of a hand on the side that you're the climbers on yeah they're, yeah. they're on this side and I'm on this side really now if they stand up and take their weight off what happens you're coming down uh -huh. I'm coming yeah. down so there's there's a whole bunch of pitfalls in doing that but well, it is possible it is possible. And the other thing is, now it's retrievable. Right. I have made a retrievable climbing you, you, line. You've made an endless loop. The other thing I can do is I can take that small line, and if I don't want to play it all out, I can put it in a little bag, mm -hmm. and it goes up uh -huh. the climbing line. Another option is this would be, I won't, just in the sake of time, I won't put that, this on the rope. But I'll go ahead and put this on the rope mm -hmm. and send it up. Okay. Now when I get up there, I have the other versatile part of my climbing line that I can, I can get up there and I can use that for a long lanyard. Okay. I can use it for a doubled moving rope. I All that has to do is come off and I've got it for a lanyard. I see. If I didn't want to send it up, in other words, I'm going to use that other retrieval, that other retrieval line. This can still be on the tail of my rope, mm -hmm. and I can climb up with it as a lanyard. Yep. I mean, I, I still generally carry my lanyard, but this makes a nice lanyard. Yep. Under most of the climbs you see, what happens again with the end of the rope? It sits on the ground. It's just laying on the ground doing nothing. Yep. Mm -hmm. We did a, I was judging an aerial rescue one time and a guy got up there and he had a separate line to bring the victim down with. 
and in his rush he forgot to take that out you don't have time in the five minutes to go come back down get your line go back up right and he was like oh crap I, you know he didn't do anything and i couldn't say anything because i was judging him as soon as he got to the ground i said dude you had a uh. whole nether climbing system you know how to tie the blake sitch right he goes yeah he said you had that whole climbing system just laying on the ground yeah why didn't you take that tail up blake's yeah. hitch bring the victim down on that you would have you would have finished yeah uh so many times we just forget about those resources and they're just laying on the ground wow. so those are those are some options when it comes to ascending what you're going to do with that secondary system and and how you're going to use it so there's there's again there's three scenarios and they're they're in that syllabus sheet um I think I think we kind of get the idea. I mean, another option is just to send it up without being retrievable. We've done that. You can retrieve it with the with the tail. Mm -hmm. um, you can retrieve it with another separate retrieval line. It doesn't even have to be a small line. If you want to use a regular climbing line, sure. Pull up another climbing line with that. Um, if it's if it's extremely short. And I kind of did that. I don't remember if the video was running for that example. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna do this one. Let me just try if try to explain it I think. So if it's extremely short and when I'm when I'm done trying to set my line, I've only got this one mm -hmm. and this other end isn't quite come down to the ground yet. Mm -hmm. That was where you can take this and tie a running alpine butterfly around the throw line. Yep. Right? Yep. And then pull it up, that pull way. it up that way. As, as this throw line keeps coming down, you just got to make sure that that loop is big enough to clear the throw bag. Right. And then it, it comes down and, and you're all you're all good and set to go. So those are kind of the three scenarios. When when the climbing line is just long enough that you get both ends, when the climbing line is long enough that you get a whole bunch laying on the ground, mm -hmm. and the climbing line is not long enough that you can have both ends set on the ground. So, you know, you've got both of those, and both of those basically work with a, a running alpine butterfly or an alpine butterfly. Okay. And without the running alpine butterfly, you don't have all those options. So mm -hmm. the running alpine butterfly really adds that um all right yeah we talked about we did talk about the not the typical flop that you see when uh rope walking because that flop is inconsequential mm -hmm. i mean it doesn't it moves around it flops around a little bit but its impact is is uh minimal um let's talk about Dragging tail, three to one, five to one, and maybe um, an on bite redirect. Yeah, definitely. Um, let me come back. Okay. Yeah, you're you're going. <clears throat> so there's a lot of ways to tie a regular alpine butterfly, mm -hmm. and I think it was BJ Brock demonstrated this once at a competition. And I didn't see how he tied it. I kind of came back and read figured out my way of tying it but it was his demonstration that was like game changer yeah i gotta know how to do this yeah. and so i mean a, a running alpine butterfly is just a huge game changer yes it and is. it's so easy to tie but safety knot just like that right if i was sending up a bottle of whatever that kind of stuff that's mm -hmm. kind of what you do mm -hmm. this comes out Right? Mm -hmm. That comes out. Notice where it notice where it came out of. Yep. That comes out and goes around. And right back in. And right back in. Before you forget where it came from, it goes right back in. And notice I'm holding it like this. I got my thumb over this yeah. and my fingers are kind of keeping keeping everything oriented. If you if you don't do that, then it's really hard yeah. to remember how right. how it runs. So this end comes I've got a hole right there, right? Yeah. That's really about the only, if you're not holding it right, I guess, but that's that's the hole that it goes in. So this comes out, and as soon as that came out, 
this hole got created. Bada bing, bada boom. And there it is. I mean, it's just, it's done. And then you always verify it with a parallel. So Peter and, and I are going to go home and do about 50 of these back yeah. to back. It's like putting a half hitch on a safety knot. Yeah. After you've looped it around. Basically, yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's all that's it is. That's a great, and this, I like that. Um, yeah, it's like a half hitch on a safety knot. Yeah. Safety knot, everybody ties a safety knot. And I've, I've showed some others and they go, well, I don't do it this way. They do it a different way. And it's like, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't help you. If, if, if you want to relearn it the way that you do a safety knot, then, That's you know, fine. go, yeah, no. <laughs> go for it. But this just, this just works. That's the easiest, simplest way I've ever seen. Yeah, I love it, it like it's that. just, it's just, you know, comes in like this because I don't have a great memory. I got to put that right back where it came from. You know, my fingers are holding it all together. Notice that there was a little loop right there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see that. I want to see that loop that comes up creates a new loop and I'm done and it's done um, if if you do you can you can there's always errors that can be made and I'd, I'd say you know when you when you come back in this way um, it could be it could be nope, don't want to see it fine yeah so I mean it's just I'm holding that it's just yeah it's just the way that looks I'm holding it as easy to hold it's easy to Grab hold, and then the hole goes back through. It just goes in like that. Done. And then again, uh, we always tie, dress, and set. Yes. And we never hear the verify part. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, the verify part is really important. Mm -hmm. It's parallel, and it's crossed. Yep. That's verified. And it wouldn't matter if I can change this if I Love want. That. I can do that, and I could put the cross on that side, and now the parallel is on that side. It doesn't really matter which side it is, but one side has to be parallel. One side has to be parallel, and the other side needs to be crossed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's tied, dressed, and set properly, you'll see that. If it's not, then you might not. It's you can mess them up. Oh yeah. I don't know what that is that I just did, but you know. That ain't it. That ain't it. You know, it's just <laughs> so that verification step is a really important. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we could add that one. All right. Yeah. We have to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it has, we that has to. to be part of I mean, that's just all of this stuff that, all of this stuff that we're doing yeah. just becomes possible. Yeah, I don't, I don't see this enough. Um, and again, it, our competition climbing events are in a little bit different environment <laughs> where the tree's been inspected. You got a tree tech up there. The, the root's been laid out. The head technician will tell the competitor where and where they can't set their anchors and whether a base anchor or a canopy anchor is required and all those kind of things. And then we get away from that environment and we're back out in the wild trees or working in somebody's yard or something like that. We kind of have to make that determination. So setting your highest anchor for functionality and all might be great in a competition, but when it comes to that wild tree, it might create a problem too so I tend to go for as close as I can to the stem and someplace within maybe 75% of the tree mm -hmm. and I don't get much higher than that of course taking in the tree and the species and the environment and all that kind of stuff setting this is what makes tree climbing different than all these other disciplines is that you know, you have to have somebody say, oh, no, I'm really familiar with that sweet gum and I think you're okay right there, you know. And if you're not, then if you're going to climb a tree for the first time, go really low someplace where the tree's really strong and start going from that and then get a feel for it and stuff. That's a whole, that's a whole other subject. But what I don't see enough is in that process, people checking their anchors. And if you look at an ANSI standard, ANSI, ANSI uh, talks, <laughs> ANSI talks, no, you're okay. I'm just, my mind is like, oh, okay. So <laughs> ANSI, it, no, 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 don't, don't go with that. I'm going to finish this and then I'm going to come back to what you're doing. I think you'll like this. Um, We're going to turn but, the video off too. Yeah, was, <laughs> ANSI has a deal in there where you're supposed to test your anchor with a double load. And I agree with that except that I would add that it needs to be a sustained load trees are built so that they can take a gust of wind 
you know, without yeah. blowing over. Yeah. And then if it's a sustained wind, that might go down, right? I mean, it's just the flexibility of a tree. But at mm -hmm. a comp, you'll see the guys, and it's more for show than anything else. But you'll see two guys, they both run over, they give it one of these, and it's, yeah, that feels good. And there is something to be said that, yeah, it feels good. I mean, these are experienced climbers, and they know, yeah, that feels good. But I think most of it is just for show. Uh -huh. But what I would what I would propose um, that uh, is taught much more is uh, a double a double load, but it needs to be a sustained load. And I've done whole videos on this, but a sustained load that tide dress set verified a sustained load that um, I'm going to send this up without any retrieval. Uh, a sustained load that you can sit there and listen to and I'm going to do it on this because this one's this would not be my normal place for setting an anchor I chose this because I needed something closer to the ground, but it's kind of sticking out onto the side I would go for something more centrally located probably something even a little higher and stuff like that But this is suiting us right now, mm -hmm. but before I start doing a lot of stuff on that little anchor I want to test it so I'm gonna have you guys give me a hand testing it and it doesn't even need to be a Climber. It can be a ground uh, person. Uh, it can be anybody, you know. Be just a friend that doesn't know how to climb. Right. And um, so this is this is just really easy to do too. So again, here's one of my the little safety knots, right? Uh huh. All right. So what I'm doing with this is I'm going to create a foot loop. Right. Yep. And all I'm going to do is put. I want this to be high enough that I can stand on it. I'm not that flexible, so I can't have it too far off the ground. And then another safety knot. As a stopper? Yep. As a stopper knot. <laughs> now, without doing anything, I can stand on this, and I can sit there, All and day. you guys can listen to it, and I can watch it, and I can look here at the base, I can see if anything's moving. And <laughs> Brett, come over. And stand This on will it. be our two-person sustain load. Just put your foot next to mine. And now if we stay, if we stay this way, if one of us rotates, then we're both leaning way back. Yeah. So there is kind of a trick to both stand in here like this. And now we got a double person load. And we're on it. And I'm comfortable. Yeah. He's comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's nobody's sitting here going, oh, we gotta get off of this in a hurry because I'm really tired. Right. I mean I'm not I'm not a muscular guy, but I can stand here and so could Brett. And we'll give this a long time. And I would shut my mouth and sit here and listen. Okay. And you can tell if anything's moving. It doesn't take long. When I'm done with it, I didn't have to take any hardware. I didn't have to take anything off my harness. Yeah. And I'm good to go. In fact, I might even use that little safety knot I used before I put my hitchhiker on there. Again, it's just safety knots. I, I just do those all the time. And more people do that. And I can't tell you the number of times I've read Facebook or whatever. A guy will talk about he was going up the rope and he got 35 feet off the ground. Notice it didn't fail right at the beginning. It didn't fail when he gave it that pull. It failed when he got about 35 feet off the ground, maybe a couple minutes. And then it failed. I mean, trees just do that. They they can take a hit, mm -hmm. but the sustained load is, um, anyway. Where the test is. I had, a, right. I had a tree go over me on one of my pole tests. Yeah. You know, it was, it was this a, was making you twitch, I gotta yeah. go. My throw line, I'll show you. I have, I, that's my throw line in my bag. Right. And then I always have another, another one. This is my other one. Okay. And you'd probably look at that and go, yeah, good luck getting this out and not being all tangled up, right? So it's that pinky thing. Yep. If you do this pinky thing for these small cords and throw line, uh -huh. and it, it looks like it's hard That's to That's the line. same as our elbow thing. Yeah, it's same as your elbow okay. thing, except mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. easy to wrap up and it'll keep it all together. Yeah. I do this with that throw line that you saw in there. Now, when I've got that, now I take this and I give it tight. Yeah. Make that tight. And that keeps that from going and being anything weird. 
And then if I'm going to store it and all that kind of stuff, you do that little loop like everybody does for their for their ropes and stuff like that. Oh, the sailors. And then right, and then you have that to throw around. Yeah, you don't uh, get it yet. Uh, uh. Now, <laughs> when you take this apart, this comes off. And if you don't unwrap it correctly, you'll end up with a mess. This one this one was the one that I started with, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Just for fun, we're going to lay this out. And if yeah. I just pull that up, and I could be dropping this out of the tree too, mm -hmm. but it'll just keep coming like that. And it just uncoils and it doesn't give me a tangle Sweet. at all. I guarantee you, if you do. Now do the pinky thing again. If you do this thing. Uh huh. And and try to do duplicate that with that, uh -huh. it it won't work. You'll end up with a, another tangle. But the pinky, again, that's that's where I start. You got to remember where you started it, and then you just do that. Just make your X's. Yeah, you just keep doing that, and you do that a while. Pretty soon your pinky gets good at it. Now, why won't it work when you do the elbow thing? Because those loops are so much big. longer mm, that bigger. they can catch on themselves. Gotcha. Yeah. When it's a smaller loop. And I've done this with my throw line. Mm -hmm. I'll lay my throw line like that, and I'll do that, and you watch that thing just go. There's a video someplace I've got out there. It just goes, and it just pulls it right out. On occasion, if you haven't done it right or whatever, it might catch a loop and mess the whole game game up. But anyway, that's a great way. And again, if you're in the tree, if, I, if I'm if i in the tree and I were to send this up to be my retrieval and I didn't want to yeah. play it out right now, I just wasn't sure if I was going to use that, and I sent it up that way, when I get up there and I drop that out of the tree, it'll fall. That comes out pretty well. Always so, keep the part that you started from. Yep, yeah, you got to, and that, that'll be the inside part. This has, this has carabiners at both ends, but if it's my throw line, Again, I'll put another little safety knot. <laughs> I'll put a little safety knot, and then my thumb goes in that safety knot. And that's yes. how I keep. That's really cool. Sorry about. No, <laughs> I no. Was watching, I was watching there. I thought, okay, there's a tangle coming. <laughs> I see the tangle. Starting to have, starting to twitch. This is this is what I use for retrieval line, and I keep saying eventually I'll get it on my website and stuff like that. Um, this was some off-shelf I, I mean I, I got it was kind of an end of a run so I need to be able to get some of this made this is a little bit small I have some other stuff that's actually what I use and it's um, I think it's about four millimeter this is like three and a half mm -hmm. if it gets too small it gets pretty tangly and it would be great if this was brightly colored mm -hmm. um, but if it's about four millimeter and the important part is that it has to be an aramid fiber non-stretch okay uh, it needs to be a Dyneema or a Spectra or, you know, one of those. Because when, who hasn't had an anchor up there that you're struggling to get out? And, and I'll put this, my foot ascender, I'll actually work on the small stuff. Oh, wow. I'll step on this with my foot ascender and I'll pull loose a stubborn anchor. Um, mm. If it was stretchy, like if you tried to do this yeah. with... You know the throw line that's all nylon, it really stretches really yeah. like Or if you did it with any kind of a nylon type of a rope. It's gonna snap, stretch yeah, and snap. Yeah, it's not gonna snap. Right. It's just that your leg just goes all the way to the ground <laughs> and your, your anchor's still stuck up there, you know? So then what you do is you, you stand on that, you try to pull another stretch, and pretty soon you got this big rubber band that you can't, and if your anchor doesn't come loose, it's like, well, how do I get off of this thing? I'm gonna, I'm, <laughs> I'm standing on a big rubber band now and I, you know, I can't get off of this wagon. So <laughs> having a non-stretch and there's uh, Sterling makes one, I think it was called power, power cord or something. Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, 5.9 millimeter. It's a little bit bigger than what I prefer, but uh, it was, it was good, except it was more expensive than climbing line so it kind of is like yeah that defeats well. the purpose yeah. other than the weight <clears throat> other than the weight factor i might as well have a regular climbing right. line. so actually kind of like the fact that it's not brightly colored anyway um you know and, and we'll see how we'll see how everything goes but maybe we can start making this available yeah i didn't wrap that up very good but i have a feeling I'll you're practice. gonna unwrap it and, <laughs> yeah i have a feeling you're gonna unwrap it and practice anyway i'm gonna go up um 
Yeah, we keep the camera running. So we're going to talk about the dragging tra tail, uh, a controlled speed line, and uh, even even a high line or a vertical line that's under tension. We talked about that. If, if somebody was hanging on this, I can put I can put the hitchhiker you on can this still rope. Do it, yeah, yeah. We can uh, demonstrate it with a safety me standing on a safety loop while you yeah, tie it in. Yeah, up there. <laughs> Um, what I think I'm going to do though is we're going to do a little descent. I'm going to go up there and just for fun, I'm going to have you guys do a little friction, frictionless hitch. Okay. Around right, that tree, the base of that tree will be strong enough. Okay. Um, so you can zip well, on I'll down. get up there and then I'll just zip down on that. Uh, a lot of devices you really can't do that on because they put a bend in the rope uh -huh. yeah. and it changes the whole dynamic of everything. Right. So, um, should I stop the camera anyway. for a minute? There's uh, something that's called dragging tail, and I'll just explain the dragging tail without actually having to go up there. But if that represented a branch that I just came over, and oh. the rest of the tail of my rope was was there, right? right? Um, a lot of devices you couldn't do this with because this tail has tension, yeah. and that tension will push against your mechanical levers or whatever's out there, yeah, and mess your world up yeah mess your world up and guys have you know again on facebook they'll tell you their stories um but with this device there i'm dragging the tail it doesn't care that's awesome it doesn't care at all i'm i'll i can drag tail all day long so you just made a three to one right there and this is and that leads into the next part this is a three to one i'll get on my weight onto this three to one i don't you know climb with a three to one that's that's using the three to one. There's no pulley on there. Wow. And I'm going up, and I probably need to snug that friction hitch up a little bit. But there's my three to one right there. Wow. And I'm gonna go up, and we're gonna show. Um, and that's just out of mechanical advantage concept. That's three to one for me climbing. If you pulled on that, what is it? If I pulled on that, what is it? Yep. If you were hauling me up with that, what is it? I would make it a four, four to one. That's actually a two to one. A two to one. Okay. Yep. It's just a two to one because this isn't really getting consumed in the mechanical advantage part. I went the wrong way. But yeah. Okay. So it's a three to one because when I'm doing this hauling myself, uh -huh. when I'm using it as a climbing system, when I get there, I've used this leg of rope. I've used this leg of rope and I've used this leg of rope when I reach my point, right? Yep. If you're pulling on it, you will consume this leg of rope mm -hmm. and you'll consume this leg of rope. But this leg of rope will stay. That hasn't changed. Yep. You never you yep. never ate. Yep. We ate this part. Yep. But you never <laughs> ate that. Yeah. It's still away from you. If I was if I was eating this rope, yep. I would eat all three. All of this would be in my stomach, right? Right. If you were eating it, you would feed this to me, but you'd never, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. You kind of have to look at what's getting consumed. Okay. So, what, is, what is that device, the, uh, the grab called? Um, that could be just a pressic, but this is a ISC rocker. And you, you could sub that out with a pulley if you wanted, right? Yeah, actually, that does have a pulley. Oh, it does. Okay. Uh, yeah, on that on that roll clip. Even without a pulley, you just put a carabiner on there. You lose some efficiency, but it still it would work. Still there. It still yeah. works. I love that setup. Um, <clears throat> so, if you sent a line when you set it in the first place with a prusik just below the alpine and a pulley on it, you could set that up initially from the ground up with a long enough rope. Say that again essentially that same setup when you when you send the rope up you mean for like a three to one climbing system yeah, or something yeah yeah i mean you could i probably would never do that you'd never uh, be able to get it down without going to get it three to what where that really comes in handy is if you're doing a limb walk mm -hmm. and then coming back from a steep limb walk mm -hmm. you know you're pulling yourself up with one arm tending with this one mm -hmm. sometimes on a really stiff steep limb walk unless you got a really strong one arm uh -huh. it's hard to pull yourself up and then tend this one so what a lot of guys do is they'll use a three to one and make sure you take this tail with you 
In fact, when I'm setting that up to do a steep limb walk or something like that, this is how I'll capture that tail so I don't forget it. Gotcha. Ooh. And then that tail's just sitting right there. Some guys will put it on their side D or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't take this tail with you, then it's laying over by the side of the tree and it didn't help you. Well, the nice part is with that like that, you also have your, now you yeah, have- Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to do that, you could, you could when you get to that point. But, but the point is right here, I'm pulling with both arms yeah. and uh, capturing all that slack and pulling myself back up off of that limb walk. So I'm going to, I'm going to go up and when I, when I get up there, just take, take this tail yeah. and wrap it around. Wait till I get up there. Yeah. Uh, wrap it around the base of that pine tree. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I'll just zip line down. Zip line down. Okay. I mean, it's just, you, with a lot of devices, really? you just can't do that. You've got to, you know, or if it was, like I said, horizontal, yeah. I can, I can do this horizontal too. Yeah. You know, and go one direction on a horizontal high line. Yeah. Um, so, but let me get up there. And once I get up there, we'll just tie that, okay. tie that end off. Okay. I'm going to put on my 10 this can be at any angle, right? Right. We've done this in the club just a ton of times. Yep. Um, and in fact, we've gone over your house a couple of times. Yeah, you know. So, um, and the hitchhiker works really well. While I'm at it, let me point something else out to you. A lot of times you'll see um, some devices, they'll put like a a, a better handhold or something that makes it easier on your hand yeah. or they'll put things on here to try to the little wood balls or to easier to release the hitch and things like that I think it adds to the vulnerability um, I hate to say that because I think they're a great little invention and stuff like that but watch how easy it is I can twist this there's a half an inch oh there's wow there's maybe a couple inches. You see how smooth that is? Yeah. Good precision. And I'm, I'm not pull, I'm not pulling down, dude. But I'll do it with a couple fingers. That's Just remarkable. Finger. And then of course I can come all the way to the ground. I love how precise you can be with it too. Yeah. It's just super hand. Super precise. Okay, go ahead and let go of that. Yeah. Um, and we won't even get probably today into the use of the extra friction because uh -huh. um, that's we're probably going to both be on rope and do that so let me see if i have very cool wow um so for fun there's also a five to one and mm -hmm. i'm going to show how we can set up um a five to one um it's actually a I can't do it because I don't have both ends of the rope with me right now. But again, if I'm climbing on it, it'll be a six to one. If I'm pulling somebody else up with it, it's a five to one. And where it becomes very effective is when you're doing like a pickoff where you want to get somebody out of a branch union mm -hmm. or off of something so that then you can then lower mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, a five to one works out really well. And this will do it with just all I had to do is put that other a pressic on again okay not a lot of hardware you know a lot of times you'll go to a comp and you'll see guys will bring the special kit yep. and you know special pulleys and stuff which is really cool um but i think it it uh when you're if you're climbing with a device that will allow you to do that if somebody's stuck in the tree the other day i was climbing with somebody and and it was starting to turn into kind of a serious thing he uh he got <laughs> And I could do this too, but he got kind of stuck in a branch union oh. with both legs. Oh, we're on God. both sides of the branch union. And then, you know, if you don't have the upper body strength to actually do a pull up, yeah, you're kind of you're, you're kind of stuck unless you can just kind of fall out with your device. So he was kind of stuck, and it was it was kind of turning into a bit of a problem. And I thought, well, okay, I can I'll just. I'm above him, I just do this five, I'll pick him off and then he can go down and stuff like that. But that, that kind of stuff can happen. I'd like to see with, that. With well, can we set that up? Climbers. So yeah, so enough rope. That was, both ends came to the ground. 
and you're gonna have to go back up to get it. Yeah, I'm gonna go up and um Oh, Alright, so I'm gonna go back up there and this connect turn this into a doubled moving rope. Um I think I have lost a lot because I don't have a friction saver up there mm -hmm. and I don't even have a cambium saver right so um, to make it to make it much more efficient I would want to put either I have a ring a ring ring and ring mm -hmm. I can put that up there put a pulley up there something like that notice I haven't had to even take off your mm -hmm. my anchor right. is still there right so with that configuration and i'm pulling myself up i have a compound six to one mechanical advantage right and again this works because you can advance it it's nothing's nothing's getting in the way of my hitch right i can advance that just push it up a little bit and go again go again now if i was somebody else standing there mm -hmm. holding Tending. down another, <laughs> another climber in the tree of if breath was me at the moment mm -hmm. and I was somebody that was stuck now it's a four to one if Brett pulls down it's actually a complex five to one and you need to pull straight down and it's gonna be harder for him to do but yeah okay that's good we're right up to the crescent now so, stuck on the crescent. so that's a five to one yeah um ideal mechanical advantage of course I've lost something because right. we don't have a pulley up there uh, what I would do if I was really going to do a pickoff like that, I'd probably s throw my uh, ring and ring up there because I travel with with that. Okay. I'd put the ring to ring up there. I'd make that two to one up there with that ring and ring. On your own system. And then I'd use this with a pulley. Okay. And one day we'll we'll take time and we'll put a load cell on here, and we'll see how much I can actually lift. Um, years ago when I was doing some stuff with experimenting with different configurations i was able to lift 800 pounds holy moly yeah and that's when you think about it that exceeds oh yeah the safe working load of your rope right, right. so you probably don't want to be doing much more than that yeah exactly and, and you're at 15 again what did what did i do that with right a the five. same guy that's just a small piece hanging on the back of my harness this this was really just all and and I didn't even need that. Mm -hmm. It could have been a pressic. Right. And then I didn't even have to redo my anchor technically. So um, if if I was trying to help this fellow climber that just maybe didn't have the horsepower to lift himself out of that branch union, uh -huh. I say, hey, no, hang on, dude. I'll I'll give you a little. I'll a give you a little, little upsy. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll just you know I didn't have to set anything up. I just you know take the anchor I've already got, come down a little bit, put this on there, and give them a little bit of a lift wow cool and if it was an actual rescue then i've got enough horsepower to set that up and actually lift a climber that is either stuck in a branch union or maybe stuck on his spikes or something like that and totally totally and then you can bring him home on your own line yeah yeah and, and that's the other thing we can talk we'll we'll do that later but with the added friction you and i and we're going to practice that yeah you and I will come down, I'll add the friction, because the friction hitch, the way I tie it, it'll probably start to creep at oh. about 300 pounds. Okay. So if you and I get on it, yep. we're both creepy. Yeah, oh, definitely. Right? Mm. Oh, yeah. So we wouldn't like that. If you were being rescued and it was turning creepy, yeah. it wouldn't make you feel comfortable. <laughs> so we can apply that extra friction. And while I'm thinking about it, you'll see this at the comps sometime or you'll see this with other climbers they will take um, the device that they have and add friction to it 
because okay. everybody knows you need to add friction to bring down the second climber. Mm -hmm. So they'll use a figure eight or yeah. maybe even a munter on a carabiner if you were in a pinch, mm -hmm. a munter on a carabiner. So they'll put that figure eight on their harness and everything. Mm -hmm. And then they'll go about getting the climber onto their system. They'll have a, the hard lock and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. If my hand's not on that figure eight, if my hand's not on the tail, he's going for a ride. Of that, how much added friction have I added? Nothing. Nothing. I've added a device. Yeah. But I haven't added any friction. Right. And so moving that victim around and doing all that stuff while you have a hand on that figure eight, because that's the only way you can add friction is to have your hand on it. Now you've got to do everything with one the hand. one hand you've got left becomes problematic and a lot of times that's never thought of it's just like okay I'm adding friction bang okay there's my added friction now I'm gonna do this and that and I'm gonna bring the um, victim to me and stuff and then we're gonna come down together depending on the weight of the victim and the rescue Randy and stuff like that sometimes it'll work yep. sometimes it'll lock up the hitch yep with the friction plug when we put that in and we put a, a little bit of a bend in the rope and some extra friction enough that now say 400 pounds isn't gonna creep down the line. Yeah. Didn't take an extra hand to do that. But we'll we'll demonstrate that on rope and stuff like awesome. that. Awesome. So, um, all right, so that was kind of the extra configuration that can stop that. Make a couple cool. Cool. That's cool. So normally this is this is my 150 foot line and I keep it in my bag. Um, I keep the um, retrieval. <laughs> when I have it. That um, 100 feet of retrieval line lives in this bag. You can see this is a little bigger than the one we're actually using. This yeah. is about uh, almost four millimeters, I think. Yeah. But anyway, so, so that lives on there. I can flake it out and let it go up. I can send it up in the bag mm -hmm. that way. Um, I can put it on my harness, take it up. You know, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, for right now, I'm not sure if I'm in it. This, this is an example of a climbing line that I have still an awful lot laying on the ground. Yep. And um, I have enough to set this anchor. And so I'll tie a running alpine butterfly. And that's ready to go up. So now I have the decision to make, do I take the tail? Do I take the retrieval line? You know, all those, all those options that you want to play, play in your head to see what you want to do. And I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and um, and notice that I've already got a secondary system Ready to go. That was living on the tail of my line uh -huh. and it's ready to go. So I'll take a carabiner and we'll use this for the retrieval. Um, but I could also take that and use it for a lanyard if that was kind of a sketchy, I, w I don't like the word of sketchy. If that was a, an anchor that I would question. Yeah or maybe a, you know, anything but a non-questionable anchor. Um, so, but I could take this and use that as my lanyard uh -huh. going up the side of the tree. In fact, I'll do that sometimes when I'm climbing um, a pine tree that's really tall and has little branches up there. Yeah. And I have tested it and everything, but I still kind of, not that I question it, but I just want to have some extra security Right. Then I'll take that and I'll put it in a cinch configuration so that I'm holding the cinch, mm -hmm. and put it on suspension points on my harness, and then I'll walk up the tree. If anything happened to that anchor that was up there, doesn't you really matter. You're on your suspensions. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'll be hugging the tree, literally. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. Having, having a bit of romance with the tree <laughs> at that moment because I'm on my suspension points and I'm right up next to it. Sure. But then I can readjust my uh, anchor, bring it down, cinch it there, go back to figure out what I'm going to do next. Right. 
so in this case I'm I'll leave I'll leave this um, retrieval in fact just for just for clutter things um, we I'll go ahead and uh, you can hook it up there I can hike that up there and then I have I have all my options available right sometimes sometimes uh, having too many options isn't a good thing but you know we're trying to just show stuff so, so there's all the options I can if I decide to leave that then I might because uh, um, I'm gonna do this on bite redirect and that uses three times the rope so that's ready to go that's the retrieval side and I always put a little Huh? You said the, the redirect uses three times the rope? Yeah, the on-bite redirect uses three times the amount of rope. Okay. Um, so, and it'll be... This will be living on my on my bridge, kind of like... I mean, this is where I store my multi-sender. It stays there until I'm ready to use it. I'll do a little daisy chain or two, and then it's ready to go. And then I'll have my secondary hmm. on the back of my harness. But since we already sent a secondary up there's no sense in me sending taking another one I gotta go up with the alpine butterfly and because I have the ends of my climbing line up there it makes it much easier for me to advance mm -hmm. my climbing line if I had a base anchor down here and if my anchor knot was tied in the middle of my climbing line then it's like, well, how do you do that? And you gotta, you know, maybe advance on your lanyard for a while and do basically a redirect through your new branch union and stuff. Um, this, I can actually, I can take that secondary system if I wanted to and not even come off of anything. Right. And once I get up in the tree, I'm much more comfortable with kind of getting a sense of what those anchors look like. Mm -hmm. I can get a close up of what the anchor looks like. I can feel what the trees telling me um, much better than if I set a really high anchor from down here and then went up to it so um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go up and I'll lanyard in we'll release the alpine butterfly and then we'll switch over and start using a quickie I kind of understand why some people won't use them because I don't think they're using them great manner so if Peter if you could just hold it that's okay so what a lot of guys will do is they'll tie an alpine butterfly and then they'll put they'll put the quickie in that alpine butterfly and um, then then they'll capture the other side and stuff like that mm -hmm. but notice when it's when it's in that that thing can just go everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it can move sword, it can get sideways, it can get this way. In fact, there's some guys will debate whether it should be that way mm -hmm. or whether it should be this way. That way. You know, and it's like. Uh. But uh, what I find and the way that I use the quickie is when I'm setting a when I'm setting an anchor, I don't again I'm I'm not using the middle of my line I find again that the most versatile part of my climbing line is the end and so if I set this for an anchor I'll set it while I'm in the tree and that way I can make sure that I see how it's oriented and I can put it through like this and now because that's a tighter eye and it tends to want to see it it, it it doesn't want to misorient because the wider part of the eye uh -huh. makes it fall back in into the eye uh, plus I can see it real well and now if I'm if it if it gets a little bit loose and I'm moving it around I'm not seeing much of an opportunity for that to get misoriented in fact it's like I said it's it's kind of hard on a tight eye you can see that's it. a tight eye yeah so you, it's kind of hard for that to get misoriented. Mm -hmm. um, I, if I really, I mean, it just you got to force it. Yeah, I don't even know if I can force that through because it's got the pin through there. Right. So it just, you know, it doesn't get misoriented. And and having having the roundness, 
having the roundness on that um, makes for uh, better recovery. So with my recovery, with your carabiner on the on the larger line or whatever um, but using that small carabiner if you can see it from this angle that just fits through there really well yeah. and becomes great recovery you just pull that down simple. it's yeah stays oriented it's it is it's simple and um, kind of a lightweight solution so when I get up there first thing I'll do is um, release that alpine butterfly mm -hmm. and make sure that i've got a, another suitable anchor that's just above me mm -hmm. i'll th throw my line up there and reestablish a new anchor with the quickie mm -hmm. as the quickie's a little bit easier to retrieve okay. plus if i don't have the right angle i don't have to worry about rope on rope in a fixed spot mm -hmm. uh burn giving me problems and if you don't pull it out fast you don't get a lot of that anyway but um Anyway, so that's setting that up. And uh, so what I'll do is I'll take the Alpine butterfly that's up there and we'll pull that off. That can go back over the side. All right. So you're asking the ask a question and again about the redirects. I mean we're the, the example that you just showed, uh, is that a separate rope or are you using this on the other end of your rope? Yeah, everything I do is with one rope. Okay. And I'll use both ends of the rope. And so um, doing that with a, with a redirect, I, I try to use what I call a clean up as I go type of a okay. redirect program. And it's really cool when you see some great climbers and They'll work their way through the tree and they'll use some natural redirects and stuff like that. And pretty soon it's like, it's come almost a badge of honor because they started over here and then their rope goes over there and then it's over there and it goes about four different places. And they're awesome climbers and stuff like that. But all of those are there. And then if you have a base anchor, it makes it easy to pull them out. But if you're not on a base anchor, if you're like a canopy anchor like that, and they've gone through a couple of those spots, it's a booger to try to to try to pull those out. Then right. want to pull out. So what I try to use, and it's, to me, it's all about positioning in the tree. It's me getting where I want to be. It's not about the redirects. It's mm -hmm. about me getting someplace. So I try to use a clean up as I go type of a system. That can entail using the, excuse the pun, but the tail of my climbing line with a doubled moving rope type of a configuration. Mm -hmm. And a doubled moving rope, that you can't, that can't be more retrievable, right? I mean, right. that's, right. and I can, I can even turn my primary into a doubled moving rope. Yep. And I can go from tree to tree to tree to tree, pulling ropes that way. So that's kind of the concept between a clean up as I go redirect type yeah. of a thing. <clears throat> Um, sometimes that might not be what I want to do. I might, in fact, we're going to go up and I'm going to demonstrate basically a redirect that when I get to the ground, I can release that redirect from the ground. It's a life support redirect, but I can release that from the ground or from another part of the tree. Maybe I've gone out on a limb and then I've walked back to the trunk. And I don't want to have to climb back to that redirect. If I just use a sling and a carabiner, right, mm -hmm. to redirect my line, I got to climb back up and, mm -hmm. and get it. Uh, with this, I don't have to climb back up. I go back to the trunk. I can pull my redirect. It comes out of the tree. It's clean. It's gone. And I can go to my next spot. So I'm cleaning up as I go and I don't end up, not that I can climb that well anyway, but I don't end up with this trail of tears trail <laughs> trail of work of every place that I've been plus the vulnerability I mean in a working environment when using chainsaws and sharp objects do we really want to have a bunch of line that's all over the place especially if you have another guy working a tree with you it's bad enough to have a base anchor and have the back side of that line going up and you're using a chainsaw and it gets lost in the ivy and stuff like that because as we know we cut down here anywhere and it's going to affect our whole climbing. So does that 
does that kind of answer that question or did I not even touch the question? Uh, yeah, more the second option. Okay. Um, <laughs> so ask probably my, my, my fault for not, not putting that well, but I'm just trying to mentally place what, because my brain went straight to, you use the other end of your rope, you tie what yeah. you just showed us, and then what, you use your second hitchhiker yeah. to pick that's, up? That's if I was going to use the cleanup as I go, the double okay. moving rope on okay. that one. Okay. So, okay. Right. All right. So that was the double moving rope. And then moving, just, I kept talking beyond that, yeah, okay. would be to go to that single line mm -hmm. and, and using um, the, the on-bite redirect. Gotcha. There's, okay. There's other... No clever redirects and stuff out there, but um, this is my preference, and we'll use it with a quickie. It doesn't have to be done with a quickie, but the quickie stays oriented, kind of takes the side load that you're going to be giving it. If you try to use, if you try to use a carabiner and you're on a small, a small limb or something like that, then it can it can mess it up. I, I have read that the quickies are much less susceptible to side loading. They yeah, hand, they are because they, they, uh, their design dictates that they can handle. Okay. It's just like a screw link. Yes. You know, a screw link doesn't have a gate on there. You screw the gate closed. Yep. But it, it doesn't have that, and it's just a big, solid, short little piece of metal mm -hmm. that doesn't have the leverage to, to bend it. Right. Um, They're very strong. I think this. Um, see what I did there? Yeah. This um, wouldn't demonstrate it real, real well, but I think it would help understand what I'm doing uh, when I get up there. So I'm going to try to just do one right on this, right on this base of the tree, and, and it'll be easier to see. Um, and this is a quickie, or uh, arbite redirector with a quickie. But basically, I'll, I'll get up, lanyard in. Mm -hmm. And I need to be lanyard in on a life support connection. Mm -hmm. If I want a lanyard in here and I don't really have a life support connection to go to, then what I can do is I can take a pressic or that um, rope, um, ISC uh, rocker, put that up there, put a tether on here, and then I'm, I'm on life. I still haven't separated my life support. I'm still here, but yet I can pull a bite mm -hmm. of climbing line. And that's what this requires, is a bite of climbing line above your life support device. So you want to make sure that what you're putting it into is going to be secure. When I say secure, it can be such that um, if it does fail, as long as this climbing line is cinched to it, then you're not going to lose all three legs. Mm -hmm. But if it's, if it's not cinched to it, if it's just, because I can do an on-bite redirect and just pull it over like that, but if it fails, then all three of my legs of rope become fall factor because they're not anchored to anything. Mm. So um, what I do is I take my top climbing line and it's gonna be kind of hard to do on this, on this vertical like this, but I think we can make the point. So I've taken a, a bite of rope ab above my climbing device because you're 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 right now on on a lanyard, so you've been able yeah, to take I'm the, on a, get some I'm slack. I'm on a lanyard, okay. and I'm life support secure. If I wasn't, I would have a life support connection up here someplace mm -hmm. that would then allow me to manipulate this rope and stuff like that. So once I've got that, then what I do is I take another bite of rope. And that's going to go through that's going to go through my quickie like this. And you can kind of see I'm going to cinch it up, but you can see what we have going on here, right? Uh-huh. So, now to cinch it up, I want to take this slack out so that if if this limb were to fail or or whatever, and I you know, depending on where I am, I am in the tree and stuff like that, the orientation of that quickie is the pins aren't touching the side of the tree and it really doesn't have any place to go it's not gonna it's not gonna rotate i suppose if you put a lot of slack you might be able to get something to rotate there but it's not gonna be slack 
And then this end of my climbing uh, goes and connects right there onto, um, onto the hitchhiker. So now I can go wherever I'm gonna go and because I can release most of the friction, I'll go out and I'm You're limb walking. Go, go on a limb walk or whatever. <laughs> and I get over, get over someplace and I lanyard in again. Maybe I'm back to the stem of the tree and everything's secure. And I'm done with that. I don't, I don't want that to be there anymore. It's not on a sling. Um, for whatever reason, I didn't use a natural redirect, mm -hmm. you know, where you just do the wind up through the trees and stuff like that. So <clears throat> this comes off. Here comes the magic. And then that pulls and it, it is so much easier to show when you're in the tree. It's just hard to video tape. Oh, shit. When I'm done that just comes back to me and I put this back on my harness and I'm back to wherever I was and I didn't have to use a natural redirect where I came around the side of the tree I'm just I cleaned it up mm -hmm. I clean that up as I go and I can do another one and clean that up as I go and if I need to use the tail of my rope for suspension between anchors and all that kind of stuff so just to prove that it actually works what I'm going to do is I'll climb up um, I'll probably step over there maybe maybe do the unbite up there and a consideration is to make sure that you have enough climbing line to do three times the length uh -huh. so if I'm up there and that's what 30 feet maybe yep um, so if I'm up there and I got 30 feet and I come all the way to the ground, that's 90 feet. Yep. And I've got, uh, you know, 150 feet of rope. So I know I'm good with that. But constantly, when you when you get a device like this that provides so many opportunities for doubled moving rope, three to ones, five to ones, on bite redirects, where you're using up a lot of rope and stuff. Mm -hmm. If you look in climbing competition regulations they'll have a thing in there that if you're climbing on a doubled moving rope you need to have a stopper knot on the end and all that kind of stuff and then you know there's there's ways to check that you'll you know do a, a drop and make sure that you've got enough climbing line if you're going to go down doubled moving rope and stuff like that um, and I see a lot of guys climbing SRT that don't have a stopper knot some don't like it because it can get stuck in a crotch when they have to pull a it branch through. Union sure on occasion and stuff like that um, some will argue about the loop thing. If you go on a limb walk and you come back, you're gonna have a loop in your rope someplace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just how it is. So manage manage the loops. Um, but uh, yeah, so you just you ha you have to mentally think about how much rope you have. And again, the advantage to having a sewn termination on both ends of my climbing line, I don't have a worry about going off the end of my rope if I were to come whatever for whatever reason if I were to come all the way down I'm not paying any attention I've seen two people climbing with me almost go off the end of their rope wow. if I came down and my sewn termination came up and locked up into the bottom of my hitchhiker here I'd probably have some words yep but I wouldn't be going anywhere right and how would I get back off of that it's really pretty easy because there's already a termination sewn on there. I just take my lanyard, right? My lanyard would connect mm -hmm. into the into the base of that, and then I'd I'd rope walk up until I take my lanyard off, and then I rope up the rope walk up the rest of it, and curse myself for making that mistake. But I'm not going off the end of the line, and I'm not hanging there because. I don't have the strength to pull right. my pull myself up. I mean, wow. lanyards are super super, super devices, and they're not just for wrapping around the tree. Yep, um, or standing on spikes. That's on beautiful. Ice. So I have a question. Um, my experience with the double end sewed uh, sewed splice ends on both ends of the rope. My experience is um, eventually 
it's going to hemorrhage my rope out because that sheet cannot move. I've, I've had that happen a couple of times to me when I double-ended my um, spice ends in both ropes. You mean that the the actual uh, sewn eye no, comes no, the apart? Sheath, somewhere in uh, if if the if the are you talking about a, like a balloon, a bubble makes? Yeah, it makes a bubble. Okay, but I it's see in what you're your rope. Yeah. So when you're coming down in your system and you're yeah. not, no, I hear you. Bubble. I hear you. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. Now. And it'll stop your cold. And yeah, and I appreciate I appreciate you saying that. Um, what I have found, and I have been climbing on this Marlow Vega for a very long time, and I've been climbing this way for a very long time with sewn eyes on both ends of my climbing yeah. line, and you can you can check any of these lines that I've been on. They don't have what you would refer to as kind of that ballooning yeah. of the cover. It doesn't slip. And then there's stats. It's just very low slip uh, rope. But you're right. If you're climbing on a rope, tendril comes to mind um, that, that milks very yeah. easily. If you sew a termination in the end of that, then what you're going to end up with is one end is going to have a big balloon on the bottom of it. Yeah. And you descend down to that balloon, and it's, it's not a... You're not going to fall, no, you, but you're going to get stuck. You'll you get, get stuck, stuck on that balloon. And if you keep going in the same direction, pretty soon that balloon just, you know, the only way to fix it would be to cut off the termination, then milk cut, it all out. And yeah, stuff. But, cut that. But this Marlo Vega, um, it, it, doesn't. it doesn't. It just it just doesn't. And I think it has to do also with the fact that the hitchhiker is not putting a bend in the rope yeah. when, it's, when it's working on it. Um, so it doesn't have... You know, if you're trying to loosen, pull something through something, you know, going this way helps maneuver it. And so anyway, so as a so as it. so as a secondary solution to the problem, if I don't have a sewn eye on both ends, I can make a a, a, a figure eight on a bike and put a carabiner on it and still bridge in. Yeah, you could do that. Uh, and if you're if you're going to climb on it, you can tie an anchor knot and mm -hmm. all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Be aware or that a bunt line hitch or whatever, yep, whatever yeah. you want. And right. uh, and this is also another advantage to the hitchhiker is that if you do end up doing that double moving rope and you terminate on on this the carabiner that's right there, mm -hmm. if you terminate that with an anchor knot that's got some bulk to it, mm -hmm. notice as soon as this comes up, it basically lifts your bulky knot away and up and above the hitch it kind of keeps it kind of keeps that because you'd, you'd be using a carabiner right um, so let's say for example you've tied kind of a bulky a bulky termination knot on there as soon as you tie that on there this thing moves it up and over it doesn't slide up or slide down your knot okay and so when you engage it it does the same thing it, pulls your your knot mm -hmm. away from the device and then it comes and brings it back in so cool it kind of it kind of helps with that if if you don't but i really i have grown to and um, i'm pretty by myself on this but i have grown to love having double-ended sewn eyes sewn eyes i don't have to worry about tie and stopper knots um, I don't have to worry about the both the ends of my line are the identical. I don't have to worry about a knot on one end and a sewn termination or splice. So you can do makes, a splice too. Who makes that rope? Marlow Vega? Yeah, this is Marlow, the rope company, and it's called Vega. I think they and I, I they have some others and stuff. And I've tried some other ropes and I can say some milk. If if it's a rope that milks badly. And I've heard people say that they were able to get this to milk, but I never seen it and I've never experienced it I mean you see all these ropes every every rope I ever use as a termination sewn in both ends yeah is that different from a tie-dye splice or is it the same thing uh, no it's it's a sewn termination okay. where a splice is actually, okay. actually spliced. Okay, gotcha. yeah. okay so artwork and splice and I I'm not a well, splicer who sells them all? I, will they, will they I do have the equipment to step on the pedal and have the thing done in about when yeah, you order it. Do they do it, or is that something you've been doing here? And when you just order, uh, you know, I do. I can do the terminations. Okay, yeah, the sewn terminations. Okay. Who sells the bottom of the way?
have enough rope to come all the way down to the ground. Oh, made it. I got a, a little busy up there with the doubled moving rope mm -hmm. being in the way and everything sometimes. But that's not there. Easier. So to do that technique you need two hitchhikers? No. The the two hitchhikers was just for the doubled moving rope okay. part where we were sharing that. Okay. Uh, for the on bite redirect, um, no, you just one line. It's kind of a just a an SRT technique. Okay. It just made it easier for him to come down to his redirect point. Yeah, if I was doing that so I don't have to pull, you know, you could have a base anchor and pull through mm -hmm. a few of those. And I'm just trying to make an example as best I can uh, that we can actually visually see. Um, Now. So that's going to go up. <laughs> Give me my and quickie back. Bam, ta da. Voila. And there's, there's my quickie back. Yep. And now it's just a matter of retrieving my the rest system. Of my climbing line. Yep. So, you know, not a really great example of where I would use it. Um, a little bit uh, cluttered, I would say. But if, if I was going to do some kind of a limb walk, come come down on a limb here, mm -hmm. and then go back over to the tree or something, mm -hmm. and then release that, mm -hmm. and maybe do another one mm -hmm. someplace else. Um, it's not so functional when it comes to just getting out of the tree. Yeah. It's great when you have long limb walks, and you can use your lanyard to kind of get out where you want to go, but when you come back, you want to be able to just do the quickie redirect and come back in one quick hit. It changes. It, yeah. it makes it where you can use that angle that you get from the redirect. Yeah. But then yet go right back to the trunk mm -hmm. and and release it. When you get back to the trunk, you don't have to go Fact. back up to the redirect yeah. to come back yeah. into the tree. I mean, there's other examples of it. Um, and it is it's rolling. rolling and we've got... Yeah, five percent. It, it should be um, two hours and ten minutes. Yeah, of of card left. So right, this is in the camera and go, uh, this is so that this, scenario. Go ahead and, and so I don't you get the do so I don't get the uh, uh, the shadow thing. On. This is probably good. I'll okay, try to good. I'll try to keep my hands out of the way. No, no. You, but this is this is the scenario no, where both ends of our climbing line uh, come to the ground or almost to the ground. Right. As I mentioned before, you could have a scenario where one end doesn't quite reach the ground. Yeah. And then you could have a scenario where the other end has a whole bunch of line on the end. Okay. And so given those two scenarios, you can choose whether you want to tie an alpine butterfly or a running alpine butterfly. Okay. And so first of all, I'm going to tie just the traditional Alpine butterfly. And this is going to be appropriate, more appropriate for which one of those scenarios? Um, probably the scenario where you have a whole bunch of climbing line that's still laying on the ground. is it, And it's more, um, or actually for this scenario would work too well too. Uh, you just have to decide. Remember that in our discussion we talked about what the anchor point is. Yeah. Maybe we didn't, but an anchor on your climbing line is where the tension of the load terminates. Yeah. Okay, right. Because you can have, an, a rope has an end and a midpoint, right? It has two ends and it has a midpoint. I mean, I, I don't think anybody would argue with that. And I've talked about how the ends are the most versatile part of the line, but most people set their anchor point at a midpoint in the line. Okay. That anchor point, even though there's midpoint and you still have a whole bunch of line coming down, that termination, that anchor, yeah. actually functionally ends up becoming the end of the climbing line. Right. And it's identified by being the end because that's where the load 
That's where the love is going to terminate. Yeah. After that, if this was 10 miles long, would it make any difference? Yeah. No. Other than the fact you got to handle that for the load, it doesn't make any difference. Right. So the termination of the load um, or the, the force to sustain that load is where the I would call the anchor or the termination of the end of the line. In this case, we have both potential ends right here. If I were to tie a mid alpine butterfly yeah. and then call that my anchor and send that up to be where the tree is, the rest of this will be retrieval line, but the actual anchor of our clamming line is where that alpine butterfly, it is where that load terminates, sure. right? Okay, so um, tying an alpine butterfly, if you search the internet, you'll probably find about four or five different ways of tying it, at least. And as we talked about before, as long as it's tied, dressed, and set, and verified with that parallel and cross sections, yeah. then <laughs> you have an alpine butterfly. You can tie an alpine butterfly and have a girth ring on it. Um, you can tie it in a figure eight manner. There's, <laughs> there's just all kinds of ways. Sure. And so if somebody wants to find their own way, that's up to them. Um, so to, for to me, tying an alpine butterfly is basically, there's the first loop, the second loop I'll put in the middle. And that kind of solves one of those issues. And then after that, I just take this one that was on the side, that just comes through, and there's... Around the line and through the hole. Yeah, okay. it goes, it circles back through there. And then I can de decide which size of loop I want to have. Um, there may be cases where I want a very tight loop, almost if, if I was going to use this for a quickie or something like that, I would form that with a very tight loop. If I thought I was going to have my throw bag have to clear that when, it, when I'm making it and that, that's not quite long enough to come down, then I'll make that loop a little longer. I'll even turn it so that it's facing the right way for the throw bag to come down through there. But I verified it with the parallel lines and the cross. And as we mentioned yesterday, I can swap this around and I can put the cross on this side and put the parallel side on that way. Doesn't doesn't really matter. Can, can you show that one more time? Yep. So <coughs> here's, here's the first loop. Then the third loop, I guess this would be the third portion. I'm putting it in the middle. So I'm laying, looking at it just like that. Mm -hmm. And then this one on the outside, mm -hmm. it's just gonna follow my hand. It's gonna go where my hand is. I, I yep. can let that kind of fall apart mm -hmm. if it wants. And then I pull it out and I'm dressing it. And as I dress it, I'll see the parallel. See it in there? And I'll see the cross. The alpine butterfly, uh, it may be just slightly less strong than like a, a running or a bowling. Yeah. If 10% difference in the strength of your knot is important to you, then you're probably on a different planet than I am. Yeah. To me, it's how the knot functions yeah. and how useful it is, how easy it is to tie and how well it stays set when it's used. The alpine butterfly, you can pull it from this way, you can pull it from that direction, you can hang loads in the, between it. Um, it's a secure knot. It just, it's, it's just a great knot. So, so which, which way does the 10% go for the uh, bowline? The alpine butterfly will be a little weaker than the bowline. And I've done, I've done some testing because I almost lost a friend climbing on the bowline. Um, I did some testing, right? And I'd tie an alpine butterfly and I'd tie a bowline and I'd, I'd uh, I would set them about the same way. And then I'd put them in my dryer in the non-heat cycle yeah. for about 30 minutes or whatever to see what came apart. And more often than not, it would be the bowline that would come apart before the alpine butterfly would come mm. apart. Interesting. And knots will come apart, not generally when they're loaded, yeah. unless they exceed a, a huge load but generally the knots will come apart when they're unloaded and the bowline especially 
um, I think comes apart easier than the Alpine Butterfly when it's unloaded. So people are using it on a base anchor and stuff. Oftentimes on a base anchor, they'll have that there and then they get off their climbing line and do something else. It goes between being loaded and unloaded. Quite often that kind of gets me a little worried. Yeah. I would rather do an Alpine Butterfly. Yeah. And you know, there's you can do a Yosemite tie off and a bowling and all that kind of stuff to try to make it more secure. I still, I must, sold believer on the alpine butterfly um, so that's how we do the alpine butterfly um, midline end of your line whatever you want to do I'll be right back okay. the running alpine butterfly and again this all goes back to my belief that this is the most functional part of my climbing line right here um, not the mid part of my climbing line this is I can do more things with the end and I can do them easier with the end than I can do in the middle. And again, I always have to uh, appreciate BJ Brock for demonstrating the running Alpine butterfly. That was probably one of the biggest game changers for how I climb and Go ahead. it was something that I always wished I could do. I just, anyway, it just made it feasible. So the running, um, the running Alpine butterfly it starts out for me the way that I tie a safety knot or a slip knot. And that starts with a left overhand loop like that. Call it whatever you want. And then to make a safety knot, we just, we bring that back up, right? Mm -hmm. And that's basically a safety knot. If you, if you were teaching somebody on a Blake sitch and you wanted to tie safety knots, mm -hmm. that would keep them from falling down and all those kind of things. It's also the beginning of that um, check we were doing with the double load yeah. and stuff like that. Because then I can just extend that out, put another one right here and stand on that loop and stuff. So anyway, when, when you look at that, this is already more than half of my Alpine Butterfly. Now, I could easily drop that end in, but I'm not going to do that because we're, we're learning how to do this. So I take this out and while I'm holding it, I'll notice there's there's a there's a hole right there right when I look at this I have a hole here and I have a hole here so I'm gonna hold it right here and kind of try to preserve as much of my knot as I can uh, when I'm tying knots if I kind of keep a hold of it it really helps mm -hmm. otherwise you lose loops and next thing you know you're confused so this comes out and then it's gonna go around whatever it's gonna go around mm -hmm. And then before I forget where it came from, I put it right back. Now I'm, I'm right back to where I was, right? Nothing's changed. In fact, I can take that out and just demonstrate but that. But assuming you didn't have access yeah, to that. End if of I didn't have it, I'd be tied around. This could be a mile long. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm now tied around that. I still have this hole up here, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to do something with it. And I come around the back side. You don't come around the front. Come around the back side. And as soon as I do that, notice I've created another another hole right mm -hmm. here. So this time, not the back side, I'm gonna go in the front side and just, there we go, right there. We have, I'm gonna dress it now, the Alpine Butterfly. Again, it's got the parallel and it's got the cross right there. It's tied, dressed, and set, verified. and. Although I've never seen one of these roll out or anything like that, it wouldn't be harmful to put some kind of a stopper knot if you don't have an adequate yeah. length on here. Have a, have a long tail or put some kind of a stopper knot. In my case, I always have a sewn termination on the end. Yeah. So, um, beautiful thing. And then again, this becomes my anchor. Yeah. This is gonna be my life support anchor and I'll do, um, whatever I'm gonna do with it, but that goes up and yeah. becomes becomes my anchor. Can we um, uh, see that knot one more time? Yep. For, so, for Pete's sake. Yeah, for my <laughs> sake, yeah, for Pete's sake. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. For Pete's sake. <laughs> nice for Pete's nice. sake. Now that we got Pete's in and all right. So I'm gonna do this one just a little quicker because people can rewind it, but it's really just uh, a simple knot to tie. I've made that the size I want. Come back around this way. Made it a little bit small. 
and that's a that's a small that's a small eye and a small tail but it's got a yeah termination on there nice and you know that was just a little faster than Did you get what that? you would yeah i got it okay. runway tie yeah so um let's practice them what do you think yeah all right Okay. Yep. So a lot of times you'll see a, a base anchor tied with a running bowline and all that kind of stuff. And again, when I see a knot that is tensioned and then gets untensioned and all that kind of stuff, I want it to kind of stay together. So a running alpine butterfly, this will be, that'll be the end I'm going to climb on, whatever. We'll get that out of the way a little bit. So this is the end I want to tie a running alpine butterfly on. The reason I want to tie the running one is because I want this knot to cinch around the base of my tree. If you if you don't tie a running cinching knot, then it can slide up the tree. So start with we're gonna get the rope around the tree, right? And then it's very much just like the other one, except this goes around the tree and for a moment kind of ignore that. But now I'm just gonna do the same thing right here, right? I do my safety knot, just like that, right? That safety knot comes out, goes back in, and I can play with the size of the loop that I want. This comes back up, and I've created that, comes back in, and there is a base anchor that I can um, pull, I'll pull down on the climbing end and get up. this where it sits down onto the onto the base of the tree. So nice. that's a running alpine butterfly for the base anchor. Um, again, if if it didn't have this termination on it, or if it didn't have a really long tail, you can put a figure eight on here. You can put a stop any anything you want to put on there for a for a stop or not. Um, you can even run it back and do a whatever but that's the running alpine butterfly for a base anchor now you can also it gets a little more convoluted and we'll save that for later if um, for example you want to tie this on a bite I'll take this apart um, if you want to tie this on a bite, in other words, you have a whole bunch of line laying here. Uh, sometimes you'll see this in a competition where they're trying to do an aerial rescue and the line is preset for the competitor and stuff. And I don't really have... Sorry, so you mean a bite in the sense of the tail end or the running end that's going to go around there. You don't, you don't want to take a hundred yeah, foot of rope so, and try to... Right, exactly. You don't want to have to, you don't have this tail to work with. If you don't have that tail to work with, maybe I can... Give me a little more rope here, Peter. Maybe I can pretend. Maybe I can pretend that I have all of this. Maybe this is another 50 feet of rope, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't have that tail to pull through there. Now I can just take a bite right there. And with that bite, I can do the same thing, right? It's still, it's still turning in to that same safety knot. It's just a bite of rope. And I take that bite. Ah, the two become come, become one. The two ah. becomes one. It's literally no different. So again, that goes in where I before I forget. This comes that loop is that mm -hmm. little loop is still there. I'm getting kind of short. That was my, no, but the, my no, lack the of idea, planning and lack of rope. The idea is clear. Yeah. So that tail that comes back through. And poor example, but that comes back through and becomes, and, it, and the same thing, I'll tie, dress, and set this a little bit, but I'll have the parallel, I've got two parallel, and then on this side, I'll have two that are actually crossed. You can kind of see where these two cross over those two. Right. And if, if I really wanted to make this work, what I would do is I'd take a carabiner or something, and I would just lock that, lock that off right there. Safety. And now I have a running alpine butterfly on a bite and theoretically I could have another hundred feet of climbing line laying over there uh, and and pull my line up so, so this is the swivel eye 
It's got a captive eye, stays in place. I don't worry about flop as much. But being my secondary system, it does have a carabiner on it. Carabiner action, auto locking. And you always want to check these and make sure that it self closes. And I don't know how many inspections we've done at climbing comps that these won't automatically close. So just make sure that that's something that you have to keep track of when you're climbing on anything that's got a lock on it. Same thing with the regular carabiner. When we do an inspection, you're gonna do that slowly and make sure that you can't get it where it stays open. What's your opinion on the click test after you let it go just to, to do a non- Just do it, do it really slow and see if you can get it to not close. Okay. If it, if it whatever you do to it, it automatically closes, then you're gonna be good. Cause remember, this is flopping around in the tree a lot. Yeah. And and sometimes guys will take these and they're setting a new anchor or they're throwing their their lanyard and stuff. If that's what you have on the other end of your lanyard. Take my dog bone. It goes through this way. And I try to have the eye. If I can see through the hole of that eye, that really works out best for me. My hitch cord goes on the other side of my climbing line. Makes that first loop. Because I have that safety knot there, I can pull down and make everything snug. And then I start doing my wraps and I hold them with my thumb. So there's one, two, three, four, five. Five is comfortable for me, but I'll always check it. The tail goes through that. And because I had it lined up, it misses that pin, makes it, makes it a little easier and comfortable. And then I tie my stevedore knot. I'm holding that eye with my thumb. I go once and I, use my middle finger to piss people off or to help tie my knot <laughs> and then i bring that up through the eye of the stevedore wow. and now i take out the safety knot and i'm gonna give it a hang and make sure it works and it's like okay i'm setting uh, setting the hitch that's feeling pretty good how does it tend it tends pretty good i'm liking that so now i'm ready to start getting on rope so you How's, have a, your, your bridge is shorter, that's why you're sitting, when you sit back on yours, I mean, I, yeah. a little more eye level than mine is. Yeah, my hitch is right, yeah, my hitch is right in front of my eyes. Yep. This is kind of right in front of my eyes. And this whole area uh -huh. that is really important to me uh -huh. is pretty clear. The only thing I have is my tending, and that's not even in the way right now. When I bring it up, I'll, I'll attach it to the anchor point right there. Right. So, that goes up, and that snugs up, and now everything's kind of nice and tight. Plus, when I sit back, it makes me very comfortable. I can sit here and watch and... I, I'm just trying to figure out why my bridge is physically shorter than yours, and yet my tie-in is still above my eye level. Because your bridge, your bridge is... That's because your harness is giving you a wedgie. Is it? No, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's got. I it's got. It. <laughs> um, also, his saddle is around his waist. It looks yeah. Like your saddle's around your ribs. Yeah, it, it's what your saddle is riding higher. That's what it is. Is your foot loops uh -huh. uh, are longer than mine are? Yes, I made them longer. Yeah. I well, there you go. There's your okay, answer. All right. You did it. So if I shorten them, that'll solve that problem. <laughs> I'm well, sure. either that or create the problem. I'm not sure. Yeah, Wiley and I hung it up on his hook in the garage when I first got it because I was not comfortable. It was really aggravating, to be honest with you. So there I've kind of set everything, and I'm liking it. Now the, my next step is to put my knee ascender on. Of course, my preference is a foldable socket. It goes on the rope, and again, it's all below my life support connection. Yeah. That's important for me. So, for touching the tree when you're walking up, it's probably 30% more efficient. Yeah, I love that. I mean, because it just, it just keeps you right up there. So, my only failure that I haven't figured out once I get my feet off the ground, I'm good, but I need to put a weight on the bottom of my line. 
so that my foot offender will feed. Let me let me come down and talk to that. Okay, good. Because I know you have. There we go. Now. Saka folds up. Oh, look at you. Yeah. Goes back on the back of my harness. Yeah, you can put it on the ring if it'll go on that. Yeah, I think it'll go around that. And we'll drop down and talk to everybody. Notice again how smooth that is. And it's just it's not I have I don't have to bang on this to release it. I just give it a tweak. Hold securely. You happy? All right. So, we're talking about putting a weight no, yeah. on your line. Right. Um, Correct. Thanks, Pete. Let me make the point okay. about that. And this is, will that attach to this ring? Will that it dog? Won't. It's too small. Oh, but you know what? I have the carabiner we're not going to use. How about I do that? You could do that. I mean, you could put it there, but it kind of binds up that whole connecting point. Okay. I'll hold it. Which is... Hold it. You recognize this, Richard? Huh? Old school? Yeah, that's they, you're right. Well, this is no, still a patented design. A, yeah. um, Here, let's do this. Oh, yes, one of those. I just need to get like a bag of these. I know, me too. Um, so, hook them in there. You know, and why don't you take this off? Let's just do this. Oh, it's girth. Yeah, oh, it'll come it right off. Leave it on. Oh, for you? Mine. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, what I would do is I'd take that off and I'd put a carabiner on there. Okay. But it's Wait. Peter's, so Peter wants the yeah, boat thing on there. Yeah, that's still work. Okay. Um, but yeah, so anyway, you're good to go. Let me just talk a little bit about putting weights on your line and chainsaws and all that kind of stuff, because yeah. people do. Yeah. Um, rope walking is really all about technique. And this ascender needs to go straight up and down the rope, right? Yep. If it's traveling straight up and down the rope, there'll be very little resistance. Yep. And I'm gonna put my foot down there, and I don't have any weights, but I do have a, a couple feet of rope underneath me. But if this is straight up like that, mm -hmm. that rope will just fall through there. Right. And if it's the first foot or two, and I only have ounces below it, if I give my foot a little bit of a wiggle, it'll go through there. So the only time I think it's really justified to put a bunch of weights on your line is if you're in a competition and you want that first foot to start out at full speed. Yeah. Otherwise, you're wasting throw bags, chainsaws, and everything else by attaching them to it's the line. It's just that first foot or two that drives it's you that first, first. Just wiggle your foot a little bit, Yeah. and then you don't have to attach all those bags and everything. Right. Saves, saves a lot of effort. But, and it's important just to keep your feet side by side and go straight up the rope. There you go. Not a fan of these carabiners. Yeah. You might have to tighten that up a little bit. You might have to do it once you stand up. And... All right, now you got your knee ascender, so take a... Take a foot ascender step and then take a knee ascender step. There you go. Yeah, now start walking, that's it. You're doing good, huh, Peter? Yeah. while I'm talking about it, it's important when you put your knee ascender on that that little carabiner isn't caught on your pant leg or something. Because if that carabiner is open at all, you'll bend it. Okay. But as long as the carabiner is closed, it'll hold a thousand pounds. And it's important to have my tending device connected. Otherwise, I'm not going to go up the rope.
Walking on by. Yeah. Hey, TJ. Hi. You want me to go up a little bit so you can get on this branch? Yeah, I was just waiting for you to do your thing. I'm also okay. kind of close to my anchor, but... Once I get up on that initial ascent, or if I'm not ascending out mid-air, when I start getting up here, I will generally just go with my foot ascender, because this foot that was my knee ascender is going to start wanting to be on the tree and on the limbs and stuff like that. So if I have tree structure to start standing on, my knee ascender just starts getting in the way. So. So another great thing I'd say about using a quickie for a cinched anchor like this, I mean, now that I'm standing on something and I'm secure, I can I can just bring my anchor up a little bit more. Oh, nice. I mean, it's, it's almost, assuming the tree will permit that, but um, it just makes a very portable, portable anchor. So now, since I've anchored... You know, we set the Alpine Butterfly to start with. Then I switched it over to a quickie because I could see a little better and everything. Okay. Quickie is probably not quite as retrievable as say a base anchor. Uh -huh. um, and I'm not inclined to want to use a base anchor, but if I were to take this and TJ, thread- could you be still for just a sec? Cause uh, <laughs> I'm having a hard time. Sure. Yeah, see it. <laughs> all of the, all of the, uh, <laughs> but the little balls are falling everywhere. So, um, this would be a little more retrievable from the ground. I'll put my retrieval end on here and it'll retrieve like a basal anchor. So now if I go and I thread this around through the tree a little bit, even if I try to make uh, an on-bite redirect and um, things like that, I might see what I can do as far as maybe moving over to that tree and stuff. Um, so if I make those, but if I have several lines traveling around, it's a little easier to retrieve with the ring and ring. This is why, you know, you're talking about setting them from the ground. I'll never set them from the ground because it's just, it's just a pain in the rear and I send up an alpine butterfly anyway. I find that much easier and more secure. So this is done with an, I use an Ashley stopper knot. It's a bigger knot. Uh, oh, for the, that's in the, that's in the. For the ring? It's in yeah. the app, yeah. yeah. Ashley stopper knot is in the Ashley book of knots. I mean, it's a sailor knot, it's a, it goes back century I think so anyway um, I'll tie an Ashley stopper knot goes under and we can practice this on the ground because I think I need some practice um, but when you look at the Ashley stopper knot it's got kind of a trifle appearance to it uh -huh. kind of like that Boy Scout deal and when you tie a dress and set it you can see that it's a really big flat knot yeah. <laughs> so that goes up and and locks against the small ring and then I'll use again that small retrieval line that uh, makes that whole thing retrievable and then for the retrieval you can use I turn this around so that the gate of the carabiner isn't inclined to catch anything on the way down it'll hit and clear that way so that's totally retrievable and now I can move about the tree and have a line that's as easy to retrieve as a basal anchor would be with the extra step of, of bringing it down. And some would say that, you know, if it's an aluminum ring, you can drop that on the ground. Most of us will use a throw line to kind of lower it down. So does that make sense? Yeah. That's cool whether, whether I'm going to retain that. Yeah, no, it's just something that can be in the toolbox later if you if you get to the point that when to use it. It's just that from 
for multiple moves in the tree when you're starting to thread that you you don't get all your redirects cleaned up it just makes retrieval a little bit easier and you can put you can put that ring and ring so that the rings under the limb or you can put it where it's, the rings are above the ring uh limb if you want you know it's what's called a flint locker um flint anderson i think came up with that but anyway i, I may end up just cutting like a square in the drywall and putting that ring and ring on a you know, one of the choices <laughs> yeah. in my garage yeah. and at least i've got a thin smooth <laughs> friction free there you go modify our houses so we can climb in them <laughs> now you're actually srt but you're using it in a three to one you're a three to one srt technique and you're not having to use a tending device so then i can use just my, keep yeah. just keep walking so yeah move yourself up how's that feel oh man i love and, that and then get up get all the way up there And your knot should set on its own, but it's not a bad idea oh, to take I just, that. I'm not I know. Used to it yet. It's, it's just a matter of. And not only that, that takes out some of the sit back. But now push push this up. I have a bad habit of doing that exact same. And thing. you don't even have to undo that oh, latch. Oh man! And it, I was I was expecting a little bit of a drop or oh. something. You oh, push that's it up. Holy shit! And see, so you don't. On that little latch right there, to look at look at me. This little latch, you engage that latch like that. And now it, it won't tend to want to slide down on its own, but if you take the tension out of that, you can still slide it up. Oh, cool. You don't have to do that latch. It just makes it where it kind of... Now, go ahead and give yourself a couple more pulls. And so again, you're doing that without having to use a tending device. I, I really or like there this because... might be some reasons yeah, to do that. I love this. I like having my legs free. I like being able to... Mm-hmm. Well, is... and you're kind of... You're kind of used to familiar with a lot of doubled moving rope pulling yourself up. Yeah. And so that's kind of your comfort zone. And so you've you've kind of adapted the SRT to meet you, the comfort zone that you are coming from. And eventually you'll get where that comfort zone isn't important to you yeah. as much anymore. It's be and a you'll nice be, training wheel. Yeah, it is, exactly. It's a good way to look at it. And there's I could there's good reasons. Use that on moving rope too, if I wanted to, couldn't I? Yeah, and if you do, we showed that the other the other day when I was showing those mechanical advantages down there. Yeah. When you do that, it becomes a five to one pick yeah. off. I want um, to try that okay. while I'm on the moving rope. Or a or a six to one or anything. That is the coolest thing. Ever. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty awesome. And you obviously can do the same thing with just a simple pressic. It doesn't have to be a rocker. No. Yeah. It can but just that be. That takes a lot of stress. I mean, it's a lot smoother than the. You mean a pressic, and then this rope going through the, the just handle a, of the. I don't have a pressic on. With that beaner, with that carabiner alone, would be a, great. A three wrap, yeah, a three wrap pressic, and then you could put that. Well, yeah, I've got a loop runner. I don't have a pressic. I um, yeah, just a just cool. a regular three wrap. You know, a, a French pressic. Mm -hmm. uh, with a, a carabiner or that roll clip, works pretty good. So after climbing a little bit, you do find that you'd like that to be a little tighter. It's just, it's, those things don't stretch out, but it'll set onto the rope. So you don't have to take the whole hitch cord apart. All you have to do is Brett's just gonna take that stevedore knot. And if you had these foam gloves, he wouldn't even have to take the gloves off because I got my fingers there. If he cut the fingers out of those, he wouldn't have to take the gloves off. You sell so, this too, don't you? Oh no, you can buy these at Costco and cut the fingers out. And then I don't have to make a profit from you. So so he's gonna take that stevedore knot out. That's not gonna work. It's too hard and too And because he's been practicing the stevedore knot down there a little bit, he's just gonna retie the stevedore knot. And he's tying it up towards the dog bone. Yep, and then he just puts the tail back through there. And now his hitch is good to go. He's gonna weight it and test it and everything. And uh, to do that, why don't you take the, just just go ahead and weight it, let, let your hitch down a little bit. Take, <clears throat> take the tail and pull, pull the tail down so it's getting the full weight. Okay, I was gonna loosening my lanyard first. No, don't, don't, because you're on it right now. Yeah. Yeah, so pull your tail down so you have full weight on the hitch. Not not the tail of your rope. 
the other tail, the, the up leg. Yeah, this one. Yeah, but don't pull it. You want it to come down. I want oh. that tail to come all the way. There you go. See, now now your hitch has got all the weight on it. Before, it was yeah, going yeah, back okay. up and down. So it that had, pressure could have been giving yeah, a false. So that could, uh, and okay. now you can look at your hitch and go, hey, you know, it's a little snugger, it's tighter. Now go ahead, and if you want, pull yourself up a little bit with that three to one and see how it feels. And it's, oh, it's now it's, much. yeah, it sets a, uh, it sets a lot more firmly oh, and, and everything else. So it's really easy to just make a fine adjustments in your hitch as you're going around the tree. You don't have to take your whole hitch apart. You just re-snug up that stevedore. And again, it's not because these stretch out. It's just that it gets kind of squished and settled into the rope a little bit. And it doesn't happen, you know, it, it takes a bit of going through the tree, but it's it's not a big deal. No, not at all. And, you know, it's 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 uh, different than a spring on a mechanical that you just can't adjust. So. so we set a running alpine butterfly to there. We switched it to a quickie. Then we switched it to a ring and ring. And then we did the tail of our line like TJ's doing to a double moving rope over there. Got there, switched to double moving rope here. Now I'm gonna go down on top of some construction equipment. And then we're gonna go ahead and retrieve our whole line from over there. Nice. On this side, of course, the tail of the double moving rope is retrievable. And we'll take this off. And then we're gonna go ahead and retrieve everything from the third tree over there. <laughs> 